Good morning. My name is Stephen Collins. I'm the CEO of Matter. Today, I am proud to present the Change Healthcare Pitch Competition. Change Healthcare is one of those companies where if you're not in the healthcare industry, you might not know who they are. But if you are in the industry, you know that they're everywhere. Last year, the company processed 14 billion healthcare transactions. One third of patient records in the United States are somehow touched by a change healthcare solution. Their data and analytics solutions are seemingly omnipresent, which is why the opportunity for entrepreneurs to work with them is really so special. This pitch competition began with a conversation at the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference in January, uh, January of this year which feels like an entirely different lifetime or an entirely different planet. Um, and in that other lifetime, we met with a few people that Trey Rawls brought together. Trey is, those of you who don't know him, he's director of market intelligence at Change Healthcare. And we're uh, grateful for that meeting that he organized where we learned more about the company's API strategy and started to talk about how we might work together. Over the last several months, We've worked uh, in concert with Change Healthcare to identify Matter member companies that could use one or more of the company's APIs to improve operations and enhance the patient experience. And today you'll hear from nine of them. I wanna thank Change Healthcare for entrusting us with this partnership. It's been a pleasure working together with Trey and his colleagues, and we look forward to continuing to do great things together. Now I'd like to introduce G. Shaw, the Vice President of Healthcare Platform and Marketplace at Change Healthcare. G is responsible for leading the company's digital and platform transformation, setting the strategy for its intelligent healthcare platform, managing its marketplace business, incubating its telehealth product offering, and coordinating across regulatory bodies to advance the use of APIs for healthcare transformation. With that, G. Uh, take it away. Thanks, Stephen. Really appreciate it. And you know, before we get started, it's it's very interesting to do a pitch fest or a hackathon in time of COVID in, in this really interesting virtual environment. So we're all lo really looking forward to uh, watching everyone pitch and seeing some great ideas. Uh, I hope everyone is safe and well. I know it's uh, nine months into the pandemic, and we're all starting to adjust to the new normal. And so hopefully you're all safe, your families are safe, and we're looking forward to a very interesting day. Before we get started, let me introduce you a little bit to Change Healthcare, following on to what Stephen uh, talked about, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we do. The first thing, it's important to note, what is Change Healthcare? And, and usually before going into the details, I like to point out, Change Healthcare operates at the scale of the US healthcare system. And that's important only because when we talk about what we do, we don't talk about it for one or two payer organizations or one or two providers or some small number of patients. We talk about it at scale. We talk about it for 95 plus percent of the payers, the providers, and the patients, and one third of the patients that they serve across the US healthcare ecosystem. And that gives us a very interesting position and point of view. Sitting at the center, we're able to see what's going through the data. We're able to take the data and see what's going on through our analytics. Using our analytics, we're able to see how we can impact patient care, provider efficiency, and payer efficiency. And ultimately, we sit in a place, because we're again in the center of the ecosystem, where we can drive innovation. And that's a really big part of our strategy through the Change Healthcare platform, is finding ways to drive innovation through the healthcare ecosystem, through the use of not just our data and our analytics, but really easy ways to get that data, the analytics and the insights they provide out into the ecosystem. I won't go through all the numbers here, you can see those, but you know, take, take away that core point. We operate at the scale of the system. We are the underlying financial management platform that powers US healthcare. Next slide. And so what do we do? We think about being in the center of the ecosystem. We really touch all pieces of the operational workflow that makes healthcare work. We touch and provide solutions to eliminate wasteful spending. We touch and provide 
solutions to manage growth in high-risk populations, especially the older population. I'm not going to make the, the requisite comment here about what we think is going to happen with the new Supreme Court justice and, and changes to ACA, but certainly, you know, we do see changes coming in that area. We have solutions that enable provider and payer organizations to manage a shift to value-based care to help consumers, members and patients, us, manage this idea of increasing consumerism and greater access to our data. And we have solutions that help us manage the, the need to create interoperability and touch to all the healthcare data. Because at the end of the day, two things are apparent. One, uh, healthcare is a team sport and team sport only works when everyone is armed with all the same data and all the same insights. And we are the masters of that data ourselves as patients and as change healthcare sitting in the center of the ecosystem. So how do we get that data to be liquid? How do we get that data out there so it can be used to create insights in, into applications and into the hands of the end users? Next slide, please. So how do we do that? Oops, we'll wait till we get there. <laughs> so how do we do that? Well, as I said, we are the healthcare financial management platform informed by clinical insights. We sit at the nexus of any number of healthcare transactions, whether they be coverage, and eligibility, payments and reimbursements, claims and the claims lifecycle, as well as the data itself. And we take that information and run it through what we call our intelligent healthcare platform, which is the platform that starts with the transactions at the bottom and gets to the marketplace and the APIs and the way that we enable them at the top. We do that in a way that maintains the security and privacy of that data, the scalability of the delivery of the insights developed from that data, and ultimately all the products and services that are, services that are needed to deliver those insights. Now, why is that important? Because as startups, as the healthcare ecosystem, innovation ecosystem, it's really hard to get to every single one of the provider organizations, every single one of the payer organizations, every single place where the data lives, the insights need to be delivered, or the patients or the members need to be touched. So we take all of that goodness, all of that information, and we make it available directly to our customers as solutions and services that touch payers, that touch providers, and ultimately touch patients and members. But we also make that information and that data and those insights available or those workflows available through our APIs, which we'll talk about a little bit more as we go through the rest of the day. We use those APIs and the SDKs and the applications they power to, en to enable next-gen opportunities for ourselves, but also next-gen opportunities and innovation across the ecosystem. And if you go to the next slide, I'll talk to you a little bit about how we actually do that. There it goes. So Change Healthcare is the trusted marketplace for the healthcare ecosystem. We take all of our products and we have a vast portfolio of products that touch all parts of the healthcare ecosystem, all parts of the patient continuum, all parts of the provider and the payer continuum. And we make them available as APIs, as packaged software, as data extracts, in some cases as hardware, uh, and third-party products, which we'll talk about later. And we put them into our marketplace. And that marketplace is not just transactional. We are not looking for a place simply to sell our products, but a place to engage our customers, startups, and everyone else that wants to be able to come in and explore that catalog of products to learn about how the APIs can be used. And this is important because in healthcare, some people know what this, what this means and how it works. Some people know how to use APIs. Some people understand the difference between the ED and the ER, one being a hospital department and the other one being a TV show, but not everyone does. And so how do we deliver innovation? How do we power the system? Well, there's educational material. There's ways to learn about how APIs can be used. There's flexible ways to get those APIs through flexible subscription methods. And most importantly, there's ways to manage implementation. There's implementation guides, there's a sandbox, there's try before you buy. There's all those things that lower the barrier, reduce the friction of using APIs to drive this innovation. And we make those APIs available where it's easy to get them, whether through ourselves, through our API and services connection, or through other storefronts like AWS Marketplace or Amazon Business, as well as other storefronts. The last point here is we make this available to everyone. Most importantly, we make it available to ourselves. So when you think about the APIs and software that are in our marketplace, these aren't just things that we're putting out for sale. These are things that we're using ourselves. The APIs that, you'll, that you all have used, that you'll see being used today, are the APIs that we build our products with that we've turned around, packaged, and made available to the ecosystem. Why is that important? Well, you're using an API that's also being used at the scale of the ecosystem 
pushing millions and billions of transactions through the system at the level of scale, at the level of performance, and most importantly, at the level of security and privacy that are necessary to drive trust in the use of that API. So at the end of the day, this marketplace, the API and services connection, the API products that live inside are not only there for you, they're there for us. And at the end of the day, by collaborating in this way, we ultimately make better products and we get to that goal that we are all seeking to achieve, which is better outcomes for patients, better outcomes for members. Next slide, please. So finally, why change healthcare? Why partner with us? Hopefully what you've seen in the last few minutes of discussion is we have an unprecedented market reach. We touch all parts of the ecosystem. We have made a commitment, an absolute commitment through the use of the marketplace, through our API strategy and through our marketplace strategy to power the ecosystem, to bring our products via APIs into the marketplace so people can use them and ultimately either extend or, or, or make products that work well with ours, but also ultimately get to the point of driving those outcomes. And again, product breadth. It's not just an eligibility API. It's not just a payments API. It's not just an AI API. It's everything across the continuum. So with that, I'm gonna transition over to introducing some of our judges, but before I do so, let me just express again how excited we are to see everyone pitch and to see new and interesting ways to use the APIs that we've made available to drive innovation in the ecosystem. So today you have a panel of judges from Change Healthcare that span our broader business. Let me start just in no particular order with Shiv Gopal Christian, who is the uh, VP and GM of our intelligent medical network. So the pipes, the things that make the transactions work. And Shiv brings uh, a really interesting perspective to this, this pitch competition, having come to change uh, from a broad variety of healthcare roles, including uh, from GE as their VP and GM of their revenue cycle business. Next, we have Adnan Monser. And guys, if you don't mind popping on your video real quick, just to say hi. Uh, Adnan Monser, who is our enterprise technology product leader. Adnan also has a very interesting and unique point of view, uh, also coming to us from GE, but being the product leader inside our enterprise technology organization, being the guy that thinks about product inside a R&D organization and how to actually build and help us build our products in the right way. We have Mike Creasy, who is the SVP and GM of our medical network. And Mike is, uh, I'm going to say everyone has an interesting point of view, so I'll just stop saying that. But Mike, Mike was one of our original partners in creating the marketplace and represents the highest level of maturity we have in our organization in how to build, deploy, and power the ecosystem using our APIs. He's been a great partner to us and, again, brings a point of view of how we can build an API business and really power the ecosystem. Laura Anderson. Hi, Laura is our SVP of patient relationship management and our product leader in how we build our RCM products. Now, again, I'm gonna say Laura has a very interesting background, but you know, when we think about how do we create a product that serves the patient ecosystem, the provider ecosystem, and ultimately powers all actors in the system, Laura sits in the nexus of that conversation and really thinks about how we can pull all the various products that we have together using those internal APIs, using those internal SDKs to create something that's truly consistent from a data perspective and an experience perspective under the covers. That's also important because you, you think about what you're pitching, they plug right into Laura's solutions in some cases. So she has that point of view to see how do we, how do we make all this work together. Kristen Yakimov is our product leader in the decision support area. So we talked a lot about being a financial management platform, but there are rings around this idea of the flow of money in healthcare. And one of them is decision support. How do we make and power the right decisions at the patient level, at the, at the level of patient context, at the level of payment? And so Kristen sits in the nexus of that particular part of our business, thinking about how do we deliver those insights in a way that makes sense? Sarah Linares, I see Sarah in there somewhere. Sarah is our VP of partnerships. She is the one you want to be very good friends with. She runs our partnership team and our partnership organization. And, and she's a great partner in thinking about how we take these products and bring them into the world and make it so they can power your applications and power your solutions. And finally, I'm G Shaw. I run our healthcare platform and marketplace practice, which means, like I said, I, I sit around all day thinking about how we can power the ecosystem and how we platformize our products to make that happen. So with that, Thank you judges, we really appreciate it. The last person I'm gonna point out is Trey, who I see out there somewhere. Trey, uh, before we start, just a huge thank you for putting this together. I think this is a first of many 
type of activity where we can see how our products, our APIs and the SDKs and App State Power are able to power healthcare innovation. And then we're looking real forward to seeing all the pitches. Yeah, so my name is Sam Yang. I'm the managing director and co-founder for Zandacardian. So first of all, like I always get this question, why, what's up with the name, right? Zandacardian. In fact, we were two separate companies when we started. Xander focused on PropTech and Cardian focused on healthcare. So um, um, PropTech is presence detection and occupancy counting. But what's important here to know is with radar technology, which is what we're using, you have to really understand what is going on in a given space. We're experts at that. So in fact, our, our system is already deployed into class A office buildings, shopping malls, airports, and whatnot. So we understand the space. Then the next thing is who is occupying that space? It's usually people and people have micro vibration patterns. Uh, so um, that's what we focus on. A little background story about us. Uh, we started about nine years ago from Hanyang University. So my co-founder, Professor Cho, he, he gathered up 15 PhD engineers in radar signal processing and said, hey, let's, let's push the limits. Let's see what you can do with radar technology. And we were actually one of the first companies to even attempt to do various things, fault detection, sleep apnea, um, you know, heart arrhythmia, blood pressure, only purely using radar. In 2017, we became a company. And in the last two, three years, we've done various pilots all around the world, including several uh, senior home care as well as hospitals. And last year, we actually uh, was invited to participate in Philips HealthWorks program focused on RPM. So this is the technology, uh, if you guys can see my camera. So we have uh, this device that can uh, send out 15 million mi micro pulses per second. Now, uh, what that means is we're getting every micro vibration pattern emitted from the body. So large motions, but also as you breathe, your chest is moving up and down and from inside the body, your heart is, is pumping. So it's continuous. It's completely safe, 40 times safer than Wi-Fi, home Wi-Fi routers, and has no impact. We, in, in fact, uh, we have the full EMI, uh, EMC certifications uh, on that. On healthcare, we do the vital sign as well as fall detection. But for this purposes, we're focused right on the, on purely on the vital signs. So heart rate, breathing rate for adults, the accuracy based on the last clinical investigation was plus minus four BPM and plus minus one breath per minute. And in fact, we're hopefully within about four or five weeks away uh, from getting FDA clearance. Uh, and this is for both hospital as well as for home. So uh, when we actually joined Philips program, uh, to be honest, like we have to always give them credit because they're the ones who kind of opened up our eyes about why continuous breathing matters. And we found out there is 435 million people around the world with chronic respiratory disease, you know, COPD, uh, sepsis, pneumonia. In, in fact, COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. So there, there are so many benefits to um, making sure that ev everyone is monitored continuously. Even for COVID-19, it can be now used to uh, potentially as a symptom, but also those who have recovered from COVID-19. So uh, one of the things is that we like to highlight is we make, because when you use radar, we're basically getting information from the entire body. So meaning we know you're completely resting. So we won't record anything if you're moving. And so if you're still, then we say, okay, the body is completely still. So we're able to get resting heart rate and breathing rate. And we, we do that every time that you're still, which means over one night cycle, we're averaging about two to five, uh, two to three thousand scans and measurements per one overnight uh, uh, study. So that's a lot of data, a lot of reliable data we can use, and there's a lot of benefits. Uh, in the home, for example, we can look for three plus uh, BPM increase. And this, these days with COVID-19, this has become a really highlight feature. You know, because normally your baseline RHR and, and resting respiration rate should not be moving up like this. So um, how it compares to the hospital systems. In fact, uh, we, we were surprised when we visited many hospitals with Philips, uh, 
we found out that most hospitals are actually doing visual check, meaning a nurse would come in, do a spot check, like literally look at the chest moving up and down for 20 seconds and counting. But that's spots checks. And it's also a very redundant task for the nurses. So um, uh, they use some the chest belts or CO2 mask. In fact, our data was compared to the CO2 mask. And if you start looking at the potential market, it is massive. And this is just in the US uh, market only, COPD, CVD, COVID-19 pneumonia. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there's now new studies showing that the, the people who have recovered from COVID-19 actually may require lifetime, lifelong continuous monitoring. So this is how we, uh, we, we monitored. Um, for sake of time, obviously I can't play the video. Oh, sorry about that. Um, let me just go back to the slide. So, um, yeah, so we, we actually uh, went through the uh, FDA and purposely uh, stuck with getting the at-home portion done because of CPT code 99454. Uh, this is remote monitoring of physiologic parameters, so heart rate breathing matters uh, for every 30 days. And our market penetration strategy, uh, in, this is our snapshot. So ARP became one of our uh, investors, the warrant holder of our company. And uh, they're very supportive. Uh, direct supply also very, very supportive. Uh, we're actually one of five companies that they selected to, to uh, promote. Uh, so uh, we have uh, very key partners already that can promote our technology and they're just on standby right now for us to go through the FDA. But once we do, um, the next big thing was how, so once we can get the word out, how, how do we make sure that the, the customers, the patients are eligible. So obviously that's where change uh, API will come in. And once we get that, we have to connect them to a physician. Uh, so that's also um, uh, change as well as wheel. And once we have found and they're going through a virtual uh, connection and consultation, then we'll use 3PLs to ship out the device. And obviously we have to maintain them. So claim cycle, payment solutions, reimbursements and things like that. Now, what's interesting is we also found out that on average, people need about 38 months uh, of this uh, continuous monitoring uh, or maybe longer. So it's, uh, it's a long, pretty long-term type of uh, uh, system. Uh, so we have the, the version for the hospital. We have a new one on the right, it's smaller. It's actually this device over here, uh, only does continuous restoring uh, um, monitoring. Uh, and one other very good news that we have is we also did uh, NICU testing uh, on 34 infant babies and the results were even more accurate, plus minus one BPM. Uh, so in fact, we're gonna start going through FDA process on this and this also will be used in the home. So there's an application there as well. So a quick thing on the competition. Um, one thing is uh, we have uh, journal publications, we have uh, clinical investigations, obviously FDA. And um, another step overview of the, our entire portfolio of the healthcare products. So this is our, our roadmap uh, from now until next year. So baby monitoring sleep apnea also in the works. And yes, we do have 24 patents and 21 journal publications, including several in the uh, non-contact vital sign and sleep apnea area. So this is us. Uh, we have five PhD engineers and they're all purely radar signal processing. And this is my contact info. Hey, Sam, this is Laura Anderson. Thank you. This was a really fascinating presentation. I really appreciate the time and energy you put into this. I was just trying to get an idea of where you were going beyond NICU. I saw pet monitoring, which is interesting. And you said that you're, um, you've tested this in both the ambulatory as well as the acute care environment? Yes, um, we have done that. Okay. We have all the investigation. And one small thing about pet, uh, it's the same solution, uh, but if you think about pets, they have a lot of hair, right? And any kind of contact guide sensors with a lot of hair doesn't work very well. Radars have no impact, no nothing uh, um, with pet hair, so it penetrates through and obtain the vital sign accurately. Got it. Thanks for sharing that additional information. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sam. Uh, you know, question for you that I had. So there's kind of two markets you're talking about if I'm if I'm following right one is sort of in a hospital setting where you're trying to monitor a patient. The other is in a home setting. 
if you think about those two markets, you know, where do you, where do you feel like you have the biggest opportunity? Um, and, you know, how do you see your business model needing to evolve to kind of tackle that? Yeah, so in the, in the acute setting, uh, the main purpose here is early deterioration detection. And the priority is actually the resting respiration rate, uh, not so much in the heart rate. Uh, uh, the problem, as I mentioned before, is that many of the, the respiration rate is done by visual checks, spot checks, mm -hmm. and that many hospitals are looking for a continuous method that's automatic, which means no patient participation required, no staff intervention required. So um, yeah, the, uh, many hospitals uh, have already been you know, reaching out to us. Uh, um, Kaiser Permanente looking for a pilot as soon as we have the POS, uh, the, the FDA ready. Uh, so we believe there's a great market for that. Uh, but uh, just sheer number, the, the amount of people that requires day-to-day -day monitoring because of their chronic uh, condition is mm -hmm. just the yeah, numbers are just yeah exponential. So yeah, I, we're we're happy that we can uh, uh, approach both markets. Quick question on the uh, the consumer approach, uh, i.e. the home health. What's your customer acquisition strategy? Are you going direct to consumers or are you going through uh, other channels? Right. Um, so uh, ARP, uh, as you know, it's uh, one of our uh, strategy uh, and uh, direct supply. Uh, so direct supply, it's, it's, they're one of the largest players when it comes to senior care markets. And, and most 95% um, of this uh, long-term care facilities actually buy from direct supply and we're already one of their partners. Uh, so one of the ways that, that we're trying to see if we can uh, acquire customers is to uh, go through their channels and let them approach their, their customers and introduce their solution to them. And it's a simple thing as um, like, for example, AR, ARP is just putting our, um, site a uh, new site obviously uh, uh, to on their website so that people can just go in there and type in a few information and see if they're eligible and so on and so on that's Kristen Yakimo um, really exciting technology you guys are working on and being able to do this hands-free is, is pretty awesome a mm -hmm. um, couple things when you take a look at the home market um, is the, what sort of clinical infrastructure is there in place in terms to do something with the results? And where is the science in terms of being able to determine whether the signal is good, bad, or? Um, yeah, yeah, uh, that's, that's uh, yeah. So basically we use, um, we have ways to identify using uh, AI to know who we are scanning. And secondly, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we have the ability to see that your body is still by scanning the entire body, which means that um, we, we, we call it the stability score. So if the st stability score reaches 100%, that is when we start grabbing the data about your heartbeat and the breathing rate to ensure that the data that we do collect are correct. And if someone else enters the room, we stop collecting. If they move, we stop collecting. So it's not a matter of how many times we're getting, it's a matter of how accurate, as, as accurate information as we can get, uh, um, information that we get throughout the day, every day, automatically. Uh, so on that end, um, uh, we're very, very proud about that. The, the data that we collect, again, it's, it's uh, CPD-499454 uh, defines it by 30-day uh, collection, right? So we're getting, literally tens of thousands of measurements yep. just by you doing your own thing watching tv or going to sleep in your own bed like that, you don't have to do anything to put anything charge anything press anything just live your life and you're getting all this information you're sending this information to the physicians every 30 days to to uh, see something we're, what we're not doing is we're not doing any diagnostics on our own we're not sending an alert saying hey this person is having a heart attack we're struggling up in any of Okay. Terrific. Thanks, Sam. Well, thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Melissa Schumacher, head of growth at ClearStep, and I am joined by Adil Malik, our CEO. So we are here to talk about how our product, ClearStep, can partner with Change Healthcare to improve operations and the patient experience. 
ClearStep is a care navigation and virtual triage solution that helps patients get the right care they need at the right time. We work with healthcare companies across the spectrum, primarily including health systems, payers, digital health companies, and telemedicine. Although we can't currently reveal all our partners on this page, we are also working with one of the biggest retail clinics in the US. Our customers choose us because we not only show their patients the digital front door to their business, but we also go beyond that. We bring the patients through that door to what we call fulfillment. So this means the patients are actually booking appointments through our system, scheduling a virtual visit and more. There are three products we offer at the moment in order to support our customers and patients along their entire healthcare journey. The first is our symptom checker. The patient is able to type in his or her primary symptoms into our tool, which uses NLP to come up with a set of questions to ask. Once the patient completes the conversation, we then point them to the single best next step for care, along with several features to support them in getting that care. So ClearStep recommends care options ranging from self-care at home, primary care, telemedicine, retail clinic, specialty care, urgent care, emergency departments to 911. We're unique in that we do advise users to stay home when it's relevant. So ensuring that users always receive an appropriate care recommendation for their presenting symptoms. Our product uses the most robust and clinically accurate triage engine on the market. Combined with our ability to white label with the partner's branding and configure custom endpoints based on the customer's preference, we offer a truly seamless patient experience. ClearStep goes the extra mile to deliver an actionable experience. So we match our 16 unique triage endpoints to provider and facility data while layering in eligibility information so that users aren't just told what kind of care they need, they're told exactly who to see and where to go for care. Patients can also book appointments with providers directly through our tool. So whether a system already has online scheduling enabled or is looking for a partner to, facil to facilitate their digital transformation, we can help with that. So we can schedule through the EMR, leverage third-party scheduling providers, or build directly into our partner systems. We are getting into the care coordination space. So for us, this means we are able to track patients with certain chronic conditions throughout their entire care journey, not just at the front door. So this involves us prompting them with a link to our tool where they can interact with our chat on a regular basis and allow us to track their progress. From there, health systems can intervene and text follow-up links to the patients with further guidance or resources. And finally, we offer a comprehensive business intelligence tool that allows health systems to easily track data at the digital front door, which is a whole new class of data that they've never had access to before. So for example, they're able to see what types of symptoms are being searched most regularly, along with key demographics. Change Healthcare can help clear stuff in our mission to make healthcare easy. The first area we would like to partner with Change Healthcare on is the insurance coverage component of our tool. So currently the patient has the ability to type in their insurance information, which allows them to see where they stand on their deductible, out-of-pocket max, and copay for various types of care. Today we partner with another vendor to receive eligibility information. Change Healthcare's medical network APIs will allow us to do this efficiently. Healthcare is perhaps the only industry where consumers commit to services without any idea of how much it will cost them. 
ClearStep allows for accurate prediction of healthcare costs based on patient symptoms, enabling patients and members to make informed decisions about their care. Here, we would like to use Change Healthcare's patient responsibility APIs to help patients estimate their costs beyond copays. ClearStep's making a name for itself in the industry. Our users love us with high net promoter scores across the board and strong utilization metrics from initiating conversations all the way to fulfillment. Our customers love us as well and really view us as true partners in their digital strategy and marketing goals. Our team brings together backgrounds in engineering, design, digital, and healthcare. We are the right group for the job. Your best next step for care is here. Great presentation, Melissa. One quick question. What is the, uh, what's the basis of the care pathway that you discussed at the beginning of your presentation? What's the engine that you use? If you can tell us that. Yeah, so we, we have a relationship with Dr. Barton Schmidt, who uh, developed if you've heard of the, the Schmidt-Thompson protocols, mm -hmm. um, the, these are the triage protocols that almost every nurse call center in the country uses. So it, it's pretty much the gold standard for triage. Um, and we, we have a unique relationship with the physician that founded those. So that's, that's what powers our tool. Got it, thank you. Hey, Melissa, it's Laura Anderson. Um, I shared G's comments, the great presentation. So. Um, tell me a little bit more about EMR integration and how you're doing that. And I'm assuming that your solution is also across the entire enterprise, acute ambulatory ancillary. So can tell me about EMR integration and tell me about customers that you have outside of the hospital setting, please. Absolutely. Do you want, do you want me to chime in here, Melissa? Sure, I'll go for it. Um, so, so basically the way that we've been doing uh, integration, so we, we recently just finished kind of integrations with App Orchard. Um, and so that is basically how we're leveraging or, or what we are leveraging to do EMR integration at, the, at this point in time. Um, so, you know, if a system's using Epic's open scheduling uh, module, we can kind of plug into that via, via App Orchard. We aren't currently, you know, we, we are set up to be able to actually send you know medical note or soap note summaries of our of all the information we collected you know back uh to to the physician or we've we've structured it in the right way and we have everything associated with icd and snowmed codes we haven't yet actually done that you know fully authenticated experience pushing the note back into the emr but you know that's something we're hoping to be able to do as well um <clears throat> and then the uh the, the answer is yes to your second question that you know we're, we're able to triage across pretty much um every kind of care point it, it, that that the health system has and you can do that specialty specific so that we we can technically um generally we like our engine is able to like rank list specialty care options as well for for a user however the way we typically share that information to the health or to the user is not we, we will never, <clears throat> at least currently, like, you know, say you need to go to a cardiologist. Um, we'll typically say you need in-person care, and then you kind of click open the tab that says in-person care. And the first options you're shown are for primary care docs, uh, to saying, you know, this is the first level of like where you should actually go uh, for care. But then under that, we'll show here relevant specialists too, as well. And we'll, we'll show, you know, cardiologists and we can link to, you know, information or where, where a user can actually find more information about what cardiologist is, is relevant to see. But we, we do consider ourselves right now, right now as more of front door to care, you know, trying to get someone to the right front door of the health system or the right initial entry point and we'll leave it to the PCP or whoever it is to actually you know refer them beyond that. Great, thank you. So so building on that then um, you know, who do you view as your primary customer because as I look at your business there could be three, right? One could be a consumer, one could be a care provider that wants you to own their front door and another could be a payer or an employer group that's looking drive steer the most efficient effective sites of care for their members so how do you how do you think about that and you know overall your go-to-market and your business model yeah 
So we don't consider the end user a customer, right? Um, across, no, no matter who the customer is, the actual end user is the member or the patient, right? And, and we will never charge that person to use the software or, or the service. That, that, that's kind of how, how we're structured. We're not a direct to consumer company. Um, so really we view our market segments as health systems, payers, uh, and then, you know, we kind of broadly categorize like other digital health companies that kind of includes, you know, some direct primary care companies that we work with, telemedicine companies that we work with, and, and even kind of the, the retail like entities there. But we're most focused on the health systems for, for our go to market for, for a number of reasons. Um, we think there's a lot of value to be created for, for health systems specifically by creating a new digital channel for their patients uh, or people in their general geographies to be able to find and access the right care with them. Um, but, you know, that being said, you know, like Melissa pointed out early on, like we're you know, currently deployed to you know, over 20 million, you know, commercially insured members. We're working with a really large payer. Um, so, you know, we are also pursuing that, but we think the real growth opportunity is with, is with health systems. Got it. No, that's helpful. Yeah, I was kind of thinking through that and then kind of the aspect of having this, you know, recommendation engine that's going to steer you to different sites of care and how that fits in with the health system strategy. I think one thing I'd be interested in your perspective on is, although it's certainly the right thing to do for managing healthcare costs, if I'm a health system CEO, I might say, hey, don't send that patient to Teladoc. <laughs> I want them coming to my office, right? So yeah. I can get that virtual visit. So how do you all think about that kind of conflict yeah. uh, with your customers? Yeah, so, so you know, we will always guide people to, we don't allow customers to, to mess with or configure the clinical algorithms here. We are going to recommend to what is the most clinically appropriate source of care for the user. So does that mean that sometimes we're going to divert people who may have otherwise gone to the ER to a, to a less acute, convenient source of care? Yes. But at most health systems now really recognize that like they need to make sure that happens. They need to make sure that the ER is, 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 is seeing patients, you know, with ER docs operating at the top of their license, like not handling things that could go to their primary care. They, they wanna invest in a long-term relationship with the patient so that the patient knows the health system is, is actually looking out for what is in their best interest and they'll come back time and time again then, right? So there's more a, a brand loyalty aspect to, to making sure that you are being very transparent with what the right source of care is for your user uh, or for your patient. Um, and then the other reality is like, you know, the difference between a, a health insurer is that there's a defined patient population we're working with. We're trying to make care more efficient for 20 million people, right? But with a with a health system, you know, generally you'll only see, you know, a small percentage of the total addressable patient population in the market. So if you, if you can drive ClearStep as almost a lead generator, you can get more of the right patients through the door to the ER, to your virtual care services, to your PCPs, to your urgent cares by, by kind of marketing out that, hey, look how easy and transparent we're making it to find and access care. You know, you should come get care with us because you know we have your back. So that's kind of the way that our current health system partners are thinking about it. And we think that that's, gonna, that, that's a general trend too. Thanks everyone. Um, so uh, today I'm gonna talk be, I'm gonna be talking about Limber. Uh, Limber is the first line of care for musculoskeletal conditions. Um, I'm a sports medicine physician by training did uh, have a lot of experience in alternative payment models and spent some time at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Center working on alternative payment models. And that's where I, I experienced change healthcare, where I was learning about Prometheus and what, what type of value-based arrangements um, from an alternative payment model that uh, change can do. Um, and I became really interested in outcome measure design. Uh, Limber offers our solution to employers and health systems. And uh, we'll get started. So um, our objective today is to discuss uh, three things about how we could uh, partner with change. One, we uh, have a uh, MSK assessment where we can triage patients, track outcomes, and we want to integrate into the EHR system to enhance the patient experience and specifically use the Argonaut questionnaire, the merge data between the EHR and Limber. Secondly, we wanna use uh, Limber's um, tools and um, work with the uh, changes, value-based care transformation and triage management services. And the value of the change is we could sell this to providers and payers and uh, there's new uh, physician remote monitoring 
codes that uh, we'll be talking about soon. So just quickly about the problem, uh, one in two adults suffer from a musculoskeletal condition each year. It's uh, a recent article in JAMA, it's the, the number one uh, uh, costliest condition uh, in the United States. But a lot of people wonder what can be done about this. Well, we know that exercise therapy is the evidence-based first line of care and reducing uh, by having someone adhere to exercise therapy, we can reduce the need for costly medical care. However, less than 12% of people go to uh, physical therapy today and we see high co-pays, travel distance and time constraints being some of the um, barriers for patients. And so what Limber is, it's developed by doctors in sports medicine and physical therapy, it provides a robust musculoskeletal assessment based off of how patients answer these questions in the assessment. It takes about three to four minutes to complete because we use computer adaptive testing. Uh, it risk stratifies you and triages you to the right step of care. And then if you qualify for digital therapy, we, we provide like a Peloton meet, uh, approach for, for physical therapy. And we use promise outcome measures for tracking, which is a, a core piece of our platform to date. Uh, we've done two studies at Mayo Clinic where I did my uh, fellowship that were funded by Mayo Clinic. One of them was uh, comparing our therapeutic arm and we compared our solution to traditional physical therapy and had uh, impressive results in their pain and function. And the second study that we did was we use machine learning algorithms and we compare that to physicians and physical therapists with over 20 years of experience. So the product to date, how it works, um, it's a joint specific assessment. We offer this for low back, shoulder, hip, neck, and knee. And what we do is we take into account um, who the patient is, their preferences, the chronicity of their musculoskeletal injury, promise measures for low back and neck and, and hip and, and lower extremity conditions, and then promise measures for upper extremity injuries. And so promise measures were developed between NIH and Northwestern, and there's G-codes that can work with uh, Medicare and other uh, entities that want to pair outcome measures with claims data. And so based off this assessment, we have two different, uh, we use it for two different purposes. One, we risk stratify the patient to low risk, moderate risk, and high risk, and we determine who might be a good candidate to, to a center of excellence, who should see an in-person physical therapist, or who might be able to be a good candidate for digital therapy. And then additionally, we use that uh, assessment to figure out the most appropriate exercise program for someone to do based off their injury severity. So if you have a severe back injury and you can barely walk, you're gonna be doing a different program than someone who has a minor back injury. And that we use promise measures and a few other factors to help figure out the most appropriate therapy for a patient to, to do, which allows us to get a very high response rate with our outcome measures as we're measuring an episode of care. Um, in addition, we, re we remotely monitor that patient over a one year attribution window. And so we can actually see pain and function change over time and we can pair that with claims-based data. So the return on investment to the healthcare system uh, and we work with a few healthcare systems, we can triage uh, patients um, that are seen in the primary care office to either center of excellence, if they have clinical red flags, to physical therapy and reduce utilization um, to surgeons who uh, would wanna have a higher surgical referral rate. Additionally, we uh, can work with ACOs, orthopedic bundled programs and alternative payment models. I personally worked on the first knee osteoarthritis alternative payment model. Um, to that, uh, and that's one of the things that we can do. And then we have new physician remote monitoring codes, which we can get reimbursed for. Um, so the return on investment to change, we see ourselves really working within ACOs, which change uh, is a big part of today and addressing musculoskeletal costs is the leading cost driver, pairing outcome measures, which are the most important and objective measure in orthopedics to, uh, uh, and to claims data so we can risk adjust patients appropriately. And um, just quickly, our team is uh, Michael, uh, CEO, who's our business arm of the product. Teddy's our uh, chief of physical therapy. And then I'm a, a sports medicine physician focused on value-based healthcare. And that's my presentation. Hi, it's uh, Mike Parisi. Thanks for uh, the presentation. Very, uh, you know, great technology. And I Think about your business. Um, you know, do I, a couple of things that come to mind. So one of the questions is, 
you know, are you a, you know, you kind of talked a little bit about being a partner to the healthcare system, or are you a competitor? Um, and how do you view yourself in that regard, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, more traditional, uh, you know, PT based care. And then the second question I would have is really just around differentiation. So familiar with a couple others in this space, it's certainly a lot of, a lot of, you know, emphasis right now on telehealth, virtual care, uh, and, uh, you know, the, like, you know, others out there like a hinge health. I'm just wondering, do you think about how you compete against them? How do you think about differentiation? So those would be the two kind of areas I'd be curious to get your thoughts. Yeah, so um, the first question, just one more time, what was that again, just? Oh, the first question was really, you know, um, if you think about like, like teleradiology is a good example where, you know, there are certain teleradiology services like Nighthawk where you're trying to augment what a in-person care provider delivers versus, you know, other teleradiology companies have said, look, I can just do all your readings remotely, right? And I can yeah. get specialists that are really deep at a, you know, experts yeah, so to do that. Do you view yourselves as sort of, partnering with uh, the traditional delivery system or do you view yourself as sort of competing with and disrupting it? No, we are a uh, partner. We do not think that we will replace physical therapy. We, we see ourselves uh, capturing that 80% of people that don't want to go to therapy and improving that market for mm -hmm. that. We also, uh, because of how we measure outcome measures and my, my experience working with Epic and uh, we think we can streamline that process a lot better than it, it exists to date. Um, so, and, and that's our triage platform really can improve utilization patterns tremendously. So if you're an ACO or a managed care organization, we really work with a healthcare system. So we just want to be the first step of care and manage an episode of care and over a one year attribution window, measure all the claims and pair it with quality measures and any organization that wants to do that. And we don't think that we're just disrupting the healthcare system. And then the second question that you had was, um, uh, sorry, what was the second question one more time? Differentiation, really. Just what do you think so, is you yeah, different so, from others in the space? Yeah, so a lot of people ask about this. So we have, the, the first thing is that we triage care uh, appropriately. So that's something very unique. We don't think that physical therapy, that digital physical therapy is the right step for every single person. And anyone who says differently, I, I think is, is wrong. And then, our unique uh, uh, platform is, is really uh, using promise measures, which a lot of leading hospitals use uh, for outcome measures. And we use that as an important piece of the triage and then figuring out the appropriate steps of care. So a lot of uh, digital therapy or virtual therapy, they, they don't have a really good way of progressing in a, a therapy program. And, and we see ourselves being a low cost sustainable option that matches the exercise program that meets that individual's needs. So those are some of the, the unique features of us. And the, I could talk a, a lot about promise measures, but I think that's enough that you probably want to hear about. Okay. Hello, and it's Sarah Lenars. I have a question for you. So tell us how you are acquiring customers. Are, I assume there's probably some referral models in place, but I'd love to know how you're doing with going to market and any yeah barriers running into? Yeah, so I would say that the biggest, uh, so we started working with employers because they were some of our easiest payers. Um, and that was, um, we, we set up a, 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 a per member per month model. And then uh, we had a utilization model that transformed from that. Um, our, what we've designed now is a risk sharing risk uh, sharing model that we are uh, essentially going at full at risk with uh, different employers. And then we've brought on uh, three health systems now that um, we're working with on um, the triage platform that we, we have. And what's really exciting is I, I, I worked with um, getting a uh, new code that will allow us to remote monitor and get reimbursed immediately using our platform. That's great. And uh, last question is, are you working on research papers or are you already published on some of the results you're seeing? So current waiting for the publishers, but we have two papers that we've done so far. One is how is our therapeutic arm of the platform, which is the, the therapy piece. The second one is our triage algorithm, which uh, we completed both those papers at Mayo Clinic. Um, and then uh, those are two papers today. That's great.
This is this is Adnan Mansur here. Hi, thanks thanks for the presentation. Uh, very very nice presentation and and technology here. Just from the context of um, of of eighty percent, I think you said eighty percent or even greater than eighty percent of the, the percent of the population doesn't seek or doesn't doesn't get uh, doesn't doesn't go for PT care. What is what have you seen so far in terms of motivating that? What whatever percentage of those folks uh, that that don't seek uh, seek uh, seek care uh, to to move towards an app based an app based care like like you're like you presented here. Yeah, I think uh, there's some studies I quote where the the reasons why people don't go to therapy is because people have really busy work days and they can't they don't have time to go in in person for for every visit and to be successful you have to do it three times a week for at least eight weeks. And if you have a large disc herniation in your back, um, it might take a year or two to resolve for, for, uh, with conservative uh, management. So it's not a quick fix. And so you really need something engaging. And so that's why we our, our exercise content that we match with promise measures is really engaging. So that was a big part of what we believed. And so it needed to be engaging. It had to be low, low cost and sustainable. Um, and then um, other reasons why people didn't uh, don't do an exercise program is because it's not fun. And so the progressive exercises was really an important key. So we take people from range of motion to strength to, to a full functional independence, which was uh, another uh, big factor. So I see time and then access. In our Mayo Clinic study, we had patients that had to travel 200 miles to get to a physical therapy appointment. So we learned pretty quickly that there are some big barriers of access for, for patients. So um, I think all of those are some of the barriers that exist. And then with COVID-19, it's making it more challenging to come into the clinical setting. So um, I think hospitals are really trying to look for different options of providing better care at, at patients' houses. Thanks, Mark. All right. Thanks everyone for giving me the opportunity today to present. I am the CEO and founder of CLIEXA, which actually stands for Clinical Excellence Algorithms. Give me one second and let me just start the presentation to start. All right, so very quick background about myself. Um, I actually started the company in 2016 summer and I actually left Aetna as a vice president of technology. My background was computer science and engineering. I worked for companies like Google, Microsoft, um, and Kodak, PayPal, Visa um, for almost 20 years. And my journey ended in um, Aetna and starting with Cliexa. I also um, started own and run um, a, a pain treatment center with 70 employees with five ancillary services, which also was a great playground for Cliexa. So Cliexa actually is uh, an end-to-end -end virtual health platform. Um, our goal is to transcribe the patient information, getting the functional questions, and then building a platform and push that information into the, the life of doctors and providers, which is in electronic medical records. So typical administrative burden that we always talk about is typically starting with the patients, um, basically not knowing out of pocket bills and costs, the paper forms. And of course the physicians and the administrators are struggling with the, the patient information, administrative burden, obviously patient care goes away. And obviously it ends up with the financial burden at the end by qualifying your claims and so on and so forth, which are the typical administrative burdens of this health system that we, we see it every day. So the, the, the focus of today, I, I would like to just go through the, the, the eligibility of API with Change Healthcare to start with this journey where we actually get the patients to get informed about their eligibility um, before making decisions of getting any type of treatment. And then basically having physicians focused on their care, their patients, um, again, owning and running a clinic myself uh, with a mental health and pain treatment center and MRI and diagnostic center, it is really a big burden for even doctors to figure out that the patient is not qualified or they don't want to pay out out of pocket costs. It is a big burden for the health system on the billing department. You know the story, we just get a lot of rejections. So 
it's a full stack virtual platform we built. Again, it's, a, it's not a product, it's a platform where it is easily configurable on the screening. 90 plus percent is on the clinical protocols that qualifies patient for procedures, um, that qualifies patient for certain clinical screening and build a justification and compliance and build that information directly into the EMR. And obviously the front end is, is, is basically mobile that you can customize with the alerts and just build remote monitoring on top of it and patients can actually follow up later with their condition. With that said, I actually uh, will show you and demo very quickly how this implementation with the eligible ABI we're actually uh, utilizing through Change Healthcare works. So you can see the intake platform, a customized version of it um, that can be done before a telehealth visit or in clinic. Um, the patient is going through certain steps to, to see what the process looks like. So we're asking the patients certain um, questions. This is uh, basically a chronic pain integrated care management and physical therapy services providing center. The patient responds to the questions. And then with that, we basically have the patient scan the insurance card. As you know, for each insurance, they will have their own eligibility criteria and out-of-pocket costs, which we build in the back end already. And when this is completed, um, the system will generate the report along with the clinical assessment and push it into the EMR. So this is what it looks like today on the front end. Um, the clinician will see the clinical assessments along with the administrative information and patient already knows how much the co-payment will be. We actually qualify the patient. That includes also Medicare Claims API, provider to provider API, PDM, PMPI we build. And the system enables the clinician also apply their own policies for certain things. It's an example, they, they actually create a risk analysis with their own norms. So the, the physician will see this report on the right, um, generated fully customized. It is either it's in a PDF format, it's in discrete format, and we'll push that information directly, applying highlighted policies along with the eligibility on top of it. Market is pretty big. We're focusing on non-acute care with the three most expensive disease areas. And um, with that, we started in 2018. Uh, American College of Cardiology became our investor and a partner. So we learned all the clinical protocols to monitor um, the patients with AFib, coronary artery disease, CHF, and diabetes. And we deployed the first one in November 2019 now, which is going live at Ascension right now to monitor patients with AFib. The system can integrate with any type of medical device and that you can integrate through um, integrated APIs that we have. And the protocols have been built and we're fully commercializing as we speak this product um, in partnership with American College of Cardiology. Another use case we have done, um, this is an integrated pain clinic with five locations. You can see on the administrative side, we already reported cancellations of 10% decline and save 10 minutes per patient. And we actually save 10 minutes per patient per provider per visit. Basically, we generate automated documentation using their own templates integrated into EMR. And on the financial side, uh, with the practice revenues with the additional qualified reimbursements, um, not only we increased 10%, we also um, decreased heavily the denial and rejection rates by building compliance on the billing side. So we have three uh, case studies. One of them has been peer reviewed and officially published by, uh, with Kaiser Permanente. Um, there's another one that we did with another separate uh, case study with Kaiser Permanente on a rheumatoid arthritis platform. And we also have two research publications in partnership with research that is focusing on patient report outcomes. The market is pretty crowded and we just kind of transform ourselves into an end-to-end -end digital health platform. So we are not administrative only, we have all that features, but we are actually doing a full patient care journey platform. We also have an AI built on risk identification managed by each practices, policies and treatment across time. And we obviously have compliance reported fully embedded into the EMRs. Since 2018, September, that we fully became um, in production after a year and a half of the company's um, start. Uh, we actually are now uh, in 2021, uh, have three major healthcare contracts signed. As we grow the company, we're hoping to hit over $1 million uh, annual recurring revenues. Uh, that's pretty much 90% guarantees for the next year. 
we have an FDA clearance for um, basically regulatory requirements for decision support in uh, from FDA. We have a patented indexing, but AI risk methodology and patient data collection model also so awarded in 2020, earlier in January by uh, patent office. Uh, we have full integrations, all homegrown. We don't need any third party integrations. That's the first thing I did as a developer back in the days, built the backend system. So uh, Microsoft, Azure, even on Transact, we can interact with hospital systems who are on Azure. We can directly interact with them, but we are a Latina Health Marketplace partner, Epic App Orchard partner, and we have integrations with the ones you can see. And with our integration services engine, we can interact and integrate with any other existing system within a matter of a couple of days once we have HL7 and fire requirements. So our customer acquisition is pretty uh, simple, direct marketing. Obviously, we're going to expand our cross-selling opportunities with the three big health systems we just signed a deal with. Um, we already have a distribution agreement with American College of Cardiology to go into the cardiovascular segment. Microsoft Azure Transact, we're already in their marketplace that we actually co-market together, just started early this year. And we are going through the EMR and cloud marketplaces that we partnered with. Our team is filled with technologists, um, um, the senior executives um, in the healthcare operations procurement. Uh, we have the author of American Medical Association CPT coding books, Robin Linker, helping out the flows that we can intake the patients with qualifying reimbursements. And we also have a able health scientists managing the policy and grants. With, set, with that said, I want to thank you for the opportunity and ready to receive questions. Hey, Mehmet, great presentation. Thank you. In addition to the eligibility API, which you re referenced at the beginning of your presentation, are there other APIs that you saw as you were thinking about this pitch fest that you would find interesting or you think you might use as part of your broader solution? Absolutely. Um, we actually implemented the eligibility API for uh, proof of concept purposes, and we are actually putting on the next version in human uh, practices already. Uh, but yes, uh, if you think about us, uh, we are a commoditized running cycle management complementary service. If you think about it, we try to stay away giving that message all the time as the market is crowded, but there's so many APIs that we want to implement. But instead of like presenting the implementation and go ahead and sell it and do that, we actually under promise and over deliver, which uh, we started already looking into multiple other things on the RCM section. Um, on the billing and claims part that we're building. Uh, we're, we're heavily focusing on the compliance by generating policies that, um, that we are actually relying on the clinic. So one quick answer to that is, for example, if you have certain policies to apply ancillary services, applying procedures from orthopedics to anything, uh, we want to build those policies that generates eligibility requirements for any payments that the claims are going to be going through. Um, so we are definitely looking into that, but we would like to kind of build one, start validating and get the feedback and keep pushing. So over the course of maybe next two quarters, we are absolutely looking into that one too, to answer your question. Great, thank you. You bet. So, so I, have a, I have a follow up question. So as far as your kind of you know, customer acquisition, could you, could you tell me how that works? Is it something where you rely on the provider to, um, you know, get, you know, give somebody some kind of an initial email when they set up an appointment or how do you get customers? You know, what's your primary way of getting customers onto the platform? Great question. So the, the way that our customers are small to mid-size all the way to health system customers. So once we do the implementation, depending on how that health system or mid-size clinic doing that and we, first do the discovery with understanding how they do the scheduling. So we rely on their EMR integration system. So they usually have a system by SMS or text. So quickly over, like going over that, like if I'm a patient that I have a scheduled appointment at the clinic, I will basically get a text message through the EMR. Um, they will say, okay, you're going to visit the patient. If you're a new patient, then you're going to text, get a text message with that and then an application link. It will download the app. It will take about two minutes to do the uh, download, two-factor authentication. The moment you finish that, you're wired up to the EMR directly. The system will know you're a new patient or a follow-up. It will walk you through consent forms, chief complaints, pretty functional questions, and it will detect the 
questions. Once you're done with it, when you hit the submit button, you're ready for a telehealth session or a physical, which will take roughly from five to 10 minutes. So once you're done, uh, the system will generate the documentation discreetly and in a PDF customized version in your charts in the EMR, in Epic, in the clinical works, whichever the EMR is. And now you're ready for a session. So now on this screen that I showed you, um, the, the doctor will see all the information needed. We painted the picture. Now, whatever treatments is gonna be applied um, through the ancillary services that you're providing, medication or any other services, um, the system will also know if there is a remote patient monitoring that's um, part of your, your kind of treatment. So if you're doing a ambulatory surgery procedure, the system, depending on the procedure, will trigger certain questions with the state regulations, or if you're monitoring a diabetes patient with CHF, it will trigger certain questions to, to be part of the remote patient monitoring. So it starts usually to answer a question in the life cycle before the visit, the you know, encounter ID is created by the EMR, but we have customers just using it for like a sanction deployment uh, for AFib patients we're doing for remote patient monitoring to Athena Health. They're already in the system. They get an email saying that their doctor will monitor using this app. So they will just engage through the text again to download the app and the system will take care of it after that. Got it. Thanks, that's helpful. Hey, Mehmet, Mehmet, really quick question. I'm sorry if I missed this, but are you guys doing anything related to uh, collecting patient responsibility as a prepay before the visit? Uh, we did not start yet, but that's also in the horizon we're thinking. We did not do that. We started with the eligibility API now, and um, as part of our roadmap, we're absolutely uh, implementing that. So we're also tied up with the limitations of the EMR. Sometimes not all EMRs have the full bi-directional integration. Some policies are driven by the medications they're on, if the PDM, or MME values affecting their treatment, or we're not going to even look at their um, medication refills if they didn't hit the certain criteria. So if the, the uh, EMR is not capable, uh, we're trying to figure out the patient responsibility with their own procedures, but it's absolutely on our horizon. We will build that up soon. Thank you. You bet. Okay, perfect. Well, thanks everyone. And thank you to uh, Matter and Change Healthcare for giving this opportunity. Uh, my name is Ke uh, Tarun Kumar and I'm the CEO of Cancer Insights. So Cancer Insights is basically an oncology care continuum platform uh, for providers and for patients. So we have a uh, app, app that's for the clinicians, it's a HIPAA and HIDRA certified and an app for the, uh, for the patients to bring on board. Uh, we have three fundamental goals of why we created Cancer Insights. One is to drive true interoperability. And if you look at our website, it's a little geeky, but it explains what we mean by interoperability. The second is patient empowerment, and you will see a semblance of all these three here. And the third is clinical efficiency. So we have nine use cases in our Cancer Insights. We are a early stage company, about two years old. Uh, we're doing a couple of IRB studies to prove this out. And today's presentation, we specifically targeted uh, to show you um, the intersection of uh, validated clinical data and financial data, how it changes the collaboration between a patient and provider. So with that, you know, I'll, I'll show you a quick demo of uh, that we have built specifically for this engagement, but it's very telling in terms of what the future of healthcare should be. Right. So, uh, uh, so I'll do a, a, a speaker session between Joe March, who's the patient, who's a 65-year-old female detected with breast cancer, and her and her uh, medical oncologist, uh, Dr. Radcliffe. So, here is how it goes. Uh, welcome, Joe. Uh, as you know, we had uh, all of your test results come out. Uh, we did a tumor board assessment. And for your cancer, we have created a couple of scenarios of treatment to look at. So today, we're going to look at each of these scenarios. And together, hopefully, we'll be able to arrive at a decision. Right, Joe, now let me tell you that each of these scenarios has been done taking into account the clinical validation, uh, the gold standard of treatment that's available, and doing analysis on, on the financial data as well. So Joe, as you know, um, you've been detected with stage three cancer. This uh, screen that you see is one of the three options for your treatment. And I'll walk you through all of these. So whenever we look, Joe, at a treatment, we look at the probability that the cancer will come back. So anything below uh, 30% or three in 10 chance uh, of next five years is considered very good uh, uh, standard of care. So in this particular uh, case, you know, the chance that the cancer will come back is in one in five years, right? 
What does that treatment involve? The treatment involves a minor surgery. So we start with lumpectomy. And, and the reason I wanted to bring this treatment up is I know you are busy uh, working women and, and you, uh, uh, if you don't want to have a more expansive surgery, lumpectomy will only remove that particular tumor uh, in the area, but preserve the rest of your breast. It'll be followed by chemotherapy and then a, a schedule of radiation. And that is what we call as active treatment. So these treatments can last anywhere between uh, 10 weeks to 24 weeks. And each of the treatments that I will talk about uh, will have different. Once we do the radiation, then you will be on a long-term hormone therapy, right? So in terms of the, the surgery, because this is a very minor surgery, we preserve your breast and only take out the lump. It is be an outpatient, you'll, be, you'll have some uh, soreness, but then you'll be, uh, you'll be good to go on the same day and recover within a couple of days. The, the uh, chemotherapy will be in a three week cycle. So every beginning of the week, we'll give you a medication, you'll have certain side effects, which will I talk about a little bit, and then you will recover. And that's how we'll do the six cycles. Once that active treatment is over between uh, the, the treatment, then we will go through a radiation. This is to make sure that any reminiscent cancer cells are removed. Each of these will involve certain side effects. These are very common. Uh, this data comes from a real world evidence where we looked at other patients and from the drug manufacturers. So your surgery obviously will have swelling and redness. Your chemotherapy starting, it'll have a lot of nausea and vomiting, but we have medications to control it. We'll go through a radiation, which again, will have certain skin allergies that we'll manage. And then your long-term treatment therapy would have some side effects that that's okay. Finally, uh, Joe, one of the decision points is the time. So if we start in November, we can pretty much complete your active treatment by April, so another six months, after which, you know, the long-term treatment that you take from home will be. Also, Joe, unlike in the past, I can actually talk to you about what your financial responsibility will be. So here you see a breakdown of what it costs for each of the surgery, chemotherapy, your out-of-pocket expense, and then your total cost that your insurance will pay. Because these are NCCN certified treatment plan, I believe the chances of getting these approval are pretty much 100%, so you don't have to worry about uh, not getting a coverage for the treatment. Now, let me also show you uh, how does each of these treatment compare with each other? Now in this screen, and I will change a little bit of the display to give you more focus. You know, we talked about this treatment, right? With, with about one in five chances, starting with a minor surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, and costing about, uh, you know, 5K from out of pocket. There is another option wherein we actually do a much bigger surgery. If you want to be uh, uh, very careful about cancer and make sure it's not there, we'll do a complete breast removal. So this will be a bigger surgery, but there are two benefits of that. First, you get a higher probability that the cancer will not return. Secondly, we don't need to do any radiation. It costs a little bit more, but not, not that high to worry about. The third option is, um, is doing a chemotherapy first. So, so, so Joe, in this case, we will actually do a chemotherapy before we do a surgery. We'll try to minimize the surgery again and preserve as much breast as we can, but then it will also involve radiation. Now, this treatment has very good um, metric in terms of time. So if you're really busy and you want to manage your work days, this is a good treatment plan. So Joe, fundamentally, our decision revolves around three things. How much time you can make for the active treatment, which is when you will be sick, you will need to take time off, and it, will, uh, it may result in loss of pain. The kind of things that you want and not want in a treatment. If you want to preserve your breast, you know, there are options. If you want to be more aggressive in treating it, there are those options. And finally, the cost. So let's talk about each of these. I will give you access to the system, and then together we can arrive at a decision. So pause. So that's the discussion that healthcare needs to have today, right? That is what patients need to drive confidence in their care. That is what the clinician needs to prove the viability and the concern for the patients. And that is not something that happens today, right? Uh, more than treatment toxicity, uh, patients are suffering from financial toxicity. And this example is just meant to showcase the future of how healthcare is. How do we change the healthcare? And I don't think it will happen by just uh, uh, clinical insights. It will happen at, a, at an intersection of clinical and the financial information. And like this use case, uh, there are a number of use cases that come into play, whether it is pre-authorization. This is some of the early work that we are doing, and there is a legislation in play wherein all of this information can be transparently sent through an API, through fire interface to a backend system. 
So, uh, so just to just to reverberate the point that we are trying to make is when you combine uh, outstanding clinical data, which we do through Cancer Insights, we cover about 79 cancers today. And more fundamentally, uh, unlike EMRs, which codes about 18% of the data, in Cancer Insights, we code, uh, code about 93% of the data. And by coding, I mean all the SNOMED code, CPT code, ICD-10. We code even the type of vomiting the patient has, their menstrual cycle, uh, their TNM of the cancer, uh, the stages of the cancer, and everything in between. So the quality of data, number one, is very high. Second, we lean on knowledge-driven standards like NCCN to pull the pathways that are clinically approved and that have a higher chances of getting approval from the uh, for pre-authorization from the payer. Finally, by bringing in data analytics, right? By bringing in um, a good data to bear on the good analytics, we can create value for the patient by providing the level of confidence on how the treatment will go and what kind of side effects the patient has. So we wanted to tell this story through this demo and. Uh, I'll pause here, uh, see if there are any questions or comments. Room, very nice presentation. And we completely agree with you that uh, the intersection of clinical and financial, how do you get the appropriate care at the uh, most economic price right. is, is absolutely where we need to be focused in on. Um, just out of curiosity, where are you getting the information around total cost and patient cost? Um, right. that, that's often a, a pretty clever or complicated problem. That's right. So what we are doing here is uh, we are looking at, you know, as we have the patients uh, uh, who come into our platform, we pull uh, their clinical data and we are also pulling uh, some of their financial data. What, but what we expect to do is, you know, working with Change Healthcare, we would have much better access uh, to similarity analytics. You know, we've been talking to your team and, you know, they do assessment based on patients' uh, uh, copay and they can look up and say, what are the other patients paying? So, um, Second, you know, because we have a, cl a clinically validated oncology data model, we can send a specific procedure codes, a specific aspects of the clinical data that then we can pull uh, the, the co-pays and the responsibility out of. So that's kind of how we are thinking of, of bringing this thing together. Okay, perfect. And then one other quick question on terms of, do you have a feedback loop on what the outcomes were for the patient ultimately and how that ties to some of your clinical guidelines? Yes. So, so this process starts with a, a tumor board, right? So one of the things that we do in our system is we enable a guidelines driven multidisciplinary tumor board, which is known to be a single point of highest decision making for the benefit of the patient. Uh, that workflow feeds into th this process. And finally, um, as the clinicians uh, pick a particular treatment plan, that plan is packaged as a, that's something we are working in with, with HL7 package as a fire object that that can then eventually, once the legislation for the pre-auth uh, comes, uh, gets approved, can be pushed into the, the third party system to the payer. Great, thank you. Any Sarun, questions? I have a quick question regarding uh, scaling this platform beyond the, the use case you just shared. Are you guys thinking about how to recruit patients for clinical trials and things like that as well as a future opportunity? Yes, in fact, uh, we are doing an IRB study in collaboration with MITRE, uh, American Cancer Society, and a few hospitals, and some trial matching companies. Uh, and it is uh, it is uh, goes by the name uh, Codex, M Code or Codex. You've heard about it. Uh, so we are part of that. In fact, we are doing one um, IRB, two IRB studies, one around recruiting patients to find the clinical trials. And the challenge in clinical trials, as you know, is it's unstructured data on both sides. What we have been able to do is structure on the patient side. And now we are using the third party matching services to create an orchestration platform. So we believe that as part of even the tumor board, one of the things that we are adding is that the patient gets recommended for clinical trials. So that's something we are actively working on because that is part of the, the care continuing ecosystem that we imagine in Cancer Insights. Great, thanks. Yeah, so thanks. This is Mike. I just, just a, you know, one sort of follow on question as I think about this. Um, I'm curious, what kind of reaction have you had from the uh, oncologist provider community to, you know, what you built so far? And, and um, you know, the second question just related to that is what, what is your overall sort of business model um, in terms of who pays for the service? How do you make money? Okay. So, so yeah, to the first thing, you know, so, you know, we, 
you know, I come from a different industry. I started a company in, in, in energy and sold it a couple of years back. But, you know, as we and some of my, my colleagues who are oncologists and, and cancer epidemiologists, as we went to um, various uh, clinics and, and, you know, did early adopter studies and then we did a pilot, we found that the clinicians today, the single most important metric that a clinician cares about is time. Right? If he has more time to do what he does, he will be able to do a better job. And the way they measure their time is by dying uh, death by 1,000 cuts in EMR. So what we imagine the world around cancer insights and what we've been able to do early studies is we drive about 11.5% HRVU efficiency per patient, per clinician. And that, if you look at in, in, in dollar terms, comes to around 5,000. Plus, we enable additional revenue. So, so our fundamental view is if we can unburden the clinician by having oncology specific workflow, if we can use our uh, patent pending algorithms around data curation and some of the processes to say, we know intelligently what machines can do, they can bridge the gap that EMRs do not, not by replacing EMRs, but using EMRs like as mainframes, but driving oncology workflow, there is a value to be had. So we've, we've received some pretty tremendous feedback, uh, both from not just providers, not the big providers, but also a lot of small oncology providers uh, who account for about 75% of the oncology market. They don't have good relationship with their patients. They lose a lot of patients to big hospital centers. We've also found a lot of interest in, in uh, payers who say that they want to build a better digital relationship with small oncology clinics and drive that care. Our revenue model, it revolves around a SaaS-based uh, license. We know that you know, the days of a multi-million dollar contracts are over. So we are charging on a usage basis, right? Per patient, per active month of use. So only if a clinician uses our platform, they pay for it. The second way we are able to reduce the cost of all of this is by providing then value added data analytics services uh, to both uh, 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 you know, uh, pharma in terms of running clinical trials at these underserved market and small and medium oncology clinics. And by creating a, a transparency with payer in terms of using this very high quality data and driving a value-based care between them uh, to improve the, improve the care of the patient and reduce the overall cost. Great, thank you. That's a very good uh, explanation. Great, thank you so much, Tarun, uh, for your presentation, and thank you to the judges for excellent questions. Thank you, everyone. Hi, uh, everyone. <laughs> As you mentioned, my name is Adam Antonucci. I am the co-founder and CEO of Sober Puffin, a digital health platform I'm working to improve population health by as it raised, uh, bringing um, continuity of care to substance use disorder. Um, now, before I speak about the ways we believe change healthcare will impact and improve our business, I'd like to take a second to reintroduce you to what's going on with the disease of addiction. Just about 23 and a half million people in the US are currently struggling, uh, with that number only increasing as COVID continues. And roughly 25 million people in the United States are estimated to be in some stages of remission, which is great news, but that number is only decreasing as COVID also continues to rage on. Uh, the reality is, uh, as you can see by the numbers, you know, one in seven individuals, one in three families, addiction to substances is common. So common that uh, many of you have a family member or a close friend with a disease uh, you may also know somebody who is working a program or staying within the guidelines of sobriety. Um, and that's exactly the reason we got involved. Um, my family is one of those one in three. Uh, we're fighting to bring a more comprehensive, destigmatized approach because we were on that front line and we got out and we have now celebrated the hard work that our loved one has done and is trying to, and we're just trying to give back and give that lifelong well-being to the community that we feel gave us back so much. My brother-in-law struggled with addiction silently um, to opioids specifically for nearly a decade. Um, pretty common tale these days that we see in the news, we hear about other people. Uh, for us, it was very personal. And I can elaborate on his struggle, how he you know, was one of those common people who during adolescence started indulging and experimenting. Um, how he experienced the trauma of being in a classroom of school shooting, how he damaged his body, and, and by all means should not be here today. But that doesn't do the story of addiction or the other people who are struggling 
any good because it only focuses is on him and his cure and his excuse me his his uh his fight uh and it doesn't articulate the best item either which is uh the one side of the story that we believe isn't told nearly enough um that since finding his path to recovery he is now three years into remission and he's excelled he uh as an individual as an engineer who has written the entire code base which our platform resides and if he, someone who used to frequent ERs and have side effects like asthma, which has now gone away, can get help and find a treatment path that works, uh, we feel anybody can. Um, and the difficulty is not, and it wasn't for us at least, uh, finding help. There are incredible people working to beat this disease. Not enough of them, but incredible nonetheless. And there are more solutions, digital and non-digital, entering the system every day. Um, but and it's a big but, only 11% of people that struggle find their way to care. Compare that to the over 90% of people with diabetes, which is an equal number, who find their way to care. Um, addiction is completely misunderstood and, and detrimental, detrimentally stigmatized um, within society these days. And it's costing billions of dollars to the healthcare system and even more to uh, those struggling and those families who are looking for help and don't know where to start. And what we are doing uh, with Sober Puffin is trying to change that, trying to shift the conversation because the problem, just like other social, social causes like gun violence and racism, is that the only rate, the, that is that if we only address them when the problem occurs, at the time of the problem, then the cycle of cost and preventable death will increase. And the annual toll Again, between uh, the cost and the emergency room visits and the hospitalization don't need to be that severe. So for us, what we're trying to do is solve for, again, the continuity of care, but also the engagement, uh, the engagement and recovery side. And specifically for change healthcare, we believe that uh, through the three different IPIs, you guys can help bring our uh, approach, our education, our, our experts, our placement, uh, of reliable information in a relatable tone um, to a broader audience and to uh, enable us to have a further reach. The eligibility um, uh, V3 API um, is uh, a, an addition that we can make pretty much immediately. Um, we already have the placement feature, so we show where people can find help locally and we, we utilize a few different um, uh, ways that we hierarchy of them uh, to go through uh, at a different time. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer. Um, the cost though is the number one people, is the number one reason people do not seek care. Um, stigma obviously is, is associated with that too, but the cost people feel is too much, even though that, you know, uh, those people who uh, go to 60 days worth of treatment, um, no matter what the cost, no matter who is paying for it, it is a about a 10 times uh, return on that investment. Um, so what we'd like to do, obviously, is sh currently show, uh, we currently show Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurance. Obviously, what we'd like to do is filter that through uh, that eligibility API and introduce people to what insurance they can key in and uh, hopefully do a little bit more to uh, show how easy it is um, for them to get care just for that one path. Up. Again, our main goal is to get people to take one step forward. Uh, right now, people are now taking steps forward and that's really what we call it the engagement scenario. Uh, the second way that we want to make sure that we can uh, utilize the change case healthcare database is the Argonaut provider directory. Uh, now this is gonna take a little bit of tweaking and a little bit of um, uh, cross-referencing, but currently um, people find help in multiple avenues, not just the traditional go to therapy or go to residential treatment or go seek help. It is a unique story because everybody's attachment to the disease is unique and um, effectively managing care means that you have to address that specific person and detox centers help you get the drug or the substance out of your body, the alcohol. Treatment facilities kind of facilitate you further along that path. Now, again, we know people who have gone directly from from uh, from from drinking to AA, found care, found the support they needed. We know people that have gone uh, like us through that traditional channel, detox, the treatment, the sober home, 
We know other people who skip scratch all the time. The point is that we believe that if we can help people discover more about the industry, more about the way that people can get help, those additional resources will uh, bring forth, again, more people to at least take that first step towards recovery. Therapists are an incredible avenue. Now, we, uh, we use them for our family therapists. We use them for individuals, both those uh, both my brother-in-law who was struggling and needed a specific therapist to get over his troubles and also as us individuals, as his loved ones, trying to understand what that disease meant to us. And currently, uh, the only way that people can discover a licensed and accredited therapist is through Psychology Today or a direct referral from a detox center, treatment center, or a previous patient. Now, it is not supposed to be that way, not supposed to be that hard. And if we can, again, cross-reference the provider directory to see who is so many claims uh, with some licensing data from the state who doesn't provide any of the information. We're hopeful that we could at least give a little bit more nuance to what's available out there in the marketplace. Now, the third way that we think that we can have an immense change is to support entire health system ecosystem or health, uh, public health ecosystems and community drivers. Now the patient management that we have in the background of our front facing, everything I've talked about before is the front facing puff inside, the individual, the family, the, the struggling person. We also have a back end tool that allows us to uh, have the provider tap into their patients. And uh, this works for, again, treatment centers, uh, case managers, anybody who has a touch point therapist to their, their patient itself and wants to pass along more information or, or do any of that management. We believe the telehealth medical eligibility and claims bundle can actually help us immensely by putting a value add on our business, but, um, but also uh, get people talking about prevention and early intervention. Um, there is not enough focus within, within the world today. Uh, the cost benefit, uh, you know, of, early, of, of investing early in substance use conversation and education. A lot of that has to do with the 70s, 80s, and 90s, the uh, you know, don't do drugs campaigns that, that really put back the industry. However, uh, if we can change the conversation early and often, and there are CPT codes and workflows that we can actually manage uh, those claims, uh, we can get more people that brief intervention, that momentary conversation of what they're doing is harmful to them, the behavioral implications are harmful to others, and uh, because people do learn from their actions if they are parents, and that's part of the part of the action that we're trying to get started. Because the odds of people becoming alcoholic are roughly 50/50 if they start drinking regularly before the age of 14. Now, there is no direct correlation that a parent does that. However, if we can introduce that concept and re reinforce why it is necessary for us to change that conversation through uh, different channels, um, we, can, we can utilize that evidence-based you know, intervention um, to really change some of the cost reductions that are associated with that early young, you know, that, that early adolescent behavior that, that's, that then changes into an addiction. Uh, or even the individual who is older, who is still struggling, we can hopefully get them to see that there are channels to help that they're not aware of, again, directly from their, their primary care physician. The costs are tremendous. I mean, if we can, um, every dollar spent, it, it goes, uh, goes a tremendously far away for, for the uh, benefit of society and the benefit for individuals. And that's why we are obviously impact um, zone. But again, what we're talking about is just getting people engaged. So how many people is that really? And again, I, I, even if we don't look internally, the realistic um, uh, implication is that one of three of us are, are, are within that risky drinking category already. A doctor, a therapist, uh, what we believe is even more interesting is that uh, a counselor, a, um, a whole subset of people at high school can now uh, do these screenings and get kids involved that are private in ways that just help them rethink and reimagine their connection with drugs or alcohol. Um, and that's pretty much the basics of what we're trying to do. Uh, our target clients are county and state systems, uh, trying to get in with uh, multiple avenues so that again, we can talk to the social services, 
uh, the county health system, the public high schools, to get that education started early and often. Um, throughout the, you know, throughout that target plan, obviously we wanna get through employee assistance programs because the way employers and students and even large employees are looking at addiction right now is that it's only at the time of the problem. So they're probably offering treatment, they're probably offering therapy, but they're not offering those first steps. How do you get people to engage with that? How do you get people, even if you've gotten them to go to treatment, why are you not offering them that step work? So we also offer recovery maintenance, a uh, 12 step app that, that offers alternative care, but it also showcases what's available um, locally and to them so that they continue to stay within their program and work towards that care. Um, and that's really our goal is trying to make a world of sober coffin a reality. Mm -hmm. Adam, great presentation. Hey. Go, go ahead, Laura. You go first. Thanks, Jay. Um, I was going to say, Adam, this is a wonderful presentation, and I was, uh, I am meaning my colleagues to say this one, um, I'm one of those three impacted families, so um, <laughs> this is really important work that you're doing, and I commend your passion, you know, it's wonderful. Um, tell me, though, I, 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 you know, obviously I'm thinking about how I would help my family member navigate through this and using this app. And, and using this tool. So tell me, how are you working with behavior health organizations? Have you started conversations with payers? Like, how are you penetrating the market? So payers, unfortunately, uh, believe they're doing enough to, to the industry. That's the conversations we've had with them, which was a little surprising. Um, the most interested parties uh, to penetrate the market we've found are ERs. Our, um, our counselors, you know, again, high school counselors, those within public health care systems that are already having early drinking and parents that are also not engaging in the right way. Because again, what we're trying to do with our educational element of the app is to one, approach that person struggling. Obviously, if you are having a hard time, you need to learn. But we're also approaching the family member and the loved ones because they're the ones that are probably in the majority of uh, adolescent care, especially, making decisions and nobody's talking to them. Nobody's showing them what they should look for, why this matters. And even if they find something, does that matter? Where do they start to then get that domino rolling? Because an intervention, though it sounds scary, may work, may not. It's all of these, it's all of these wonderful, uh, horrible things that coincide with addiction that doesn't happen in other diseases because we've got to attack it early and often. Um, so we're talking again to, to uh, businesses. Businesses are very excited because, again, they know that 70, you know, the statistic is 70% of um, uh, uh, workplace accidents or uh, missed absenteeism or tardiness, all, uh, all that cost is coming directly from, um, from somebody who's not seeking care or it has sought care, right. but it's fallen backwards. So that's who also is interested in continuing on with that that curve to make sure that they're supporting their, their, uh, their, their employee um, from not only start, but also through the lifetime of the disease. Got it. Thank you for that. G, mm -hmm. go ahead. I'm actually going to pass to Sarah. I'll be, I'll be quick. Actually, it's more of a, a comment. I was thinking about uh, people in the industry who really are equally passionate and one person comes to mind. It's Dr. Diana Batari, she's at Advocate Health. She runs an opioid task force and also generally substance abuse. And that's one health system that comes to mind that is going all in, making investments, going at risk to have impact on this problem area in Illinois state. So if you need a connection to her, I'm happy to make that. Uh, but I, you know, I think there are some advocates in the health system, especially those that are taking a lot of risk who own ACOs or health plans themselves that seem to be willing to uh, shift how they're handling these problems. I would, yeah, I truly appreciate that. Obviously, any, anytime we get closer to those that are, are impacted, uh, again, on those front lines, it, it, it would be incredible. We've got experts that own, um, you know, treatment centers and uh, um, therapists and, and other medical doctors that have helped support our, uh, you know, we have a question and answer scenario where we allow, uh, we have an app 
that's the way that we've we've really tried to introduce our software because everybody uses that and it's private. There's zero sign on within the system. It's a generated code essentially from an ER or a direct download, but we're not asking for any personal, personal information from the individual because we know that they're already scared to ask. Um, so we're trying to approach that in a related way because that's where we were. We know if, if we were wondering, we, w- we got isolated, we got tiny. Our, our community, when my brother-in-law first came out, became a family of three. It didn't become my entire extended family even. They didn't even know. So trying to be as personal with this as possible and learning from people like that, uh, like, like Advocate or other places that see where their struggles are, I really appreciate that. Hey, Adam, quick question. Very powerful stuff. Thanks for sharing this with us. Um, uh, questions related to acquisition of customers a little bit more deeper. Are you guys thinking about social determinants? Are you looking at which communities are deeply impacted to go target those specific geographies in the country? Can you tell us a little bit more about what your acquisition strategy and pipeline looks like? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is, is take it from an employer scenario. So which, which industries within the employment zone are actually more affected than others? Lawyers, uh, even, even healthcare workers themselves, or, you know, police forces, those are the ones that actually do have a higher tendency to fall victim to the disease later in life. So how do we get within those, change the way that they're talking about the disease so that their employees, their uh, EAPs, you know, employee assistance programs are offering this. That's really the way that we feel the saturation can get out there. Obviously, we have the alternative view, though, is within community itself, you know, social determinants of health. Are there counties out there? that are highly affected by addiction for one reason or another. How, how do we get within that community? Because really what we're trying to do is build a conduit system so that you can go on and see what's available to you. Now, again, each individual might want to access that marketplace in a different way. They might wanna go directly to a detox center, directly to a treatment facility. But we know from our experience and from talking to hundreds of people that, have, uh, that are currently in remission that they didn't access it that way. They went through to AA first. They went to an alternative care place. Um, uh, one, uh, one is a workout, you know, uh, substance um, uh, community support mechanism where they, they, they literally just tell people to be sober. Another wanted their, their entire network to be online. So the reason that we're trying to diversify the conversation is to allow other people to see that the avenue is not a straight line. It is, it, it, everybody's path can be unique and everybody can find the support that they need, whether that be alone, hopefully there are loved ones and others coming along with you and educating them as well to to join that conversation. Thanks, Sam. Well, uh, welcome everyone and thanks so much for having us here today. We're so excited to be presenting alongside uh, such great startups and to this esteemed panel of judges. Uh, my name is Greg Cochera. I'm the Vice President of Sales and Marketing here at Azuba. We also have Bart Carlson, our uh, founder and CEO on the line. Uh, and what we're going to be talking about here today is the Azuba Lifetime Clinical Records app. We've had a couple conversations over the last couple weeks uh, with Joe Baimia and Spencer Cross about consumer connected health and the exciting things that Change Healthcare is doing with interoperability and their interoperability API. And we believe that Azuba can really partner together with uh, Change Healthcare to be the front end for this uh, consumer connected um, health initiative and help consumers and their families save time, save costs, and save lives uh, in, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, long run. So we're all aware of the 300,000 uh, uh, debts that we're on the trajectory for for uh, COVID-19 here in 2020. What we don't hear about in the news, uh, the way that we do hear about the tragic COVID deaths, is the 300,000 people that we lose every year due to the lack of clinical data availability at the time of treatment and diagnosis uh, of uh, medical issues. So that's the problem that we would really like to help solve. We'd like to do well by doing good here, and, uh, and we believe that there's some exciting synergies we can partner with Change Healthcare on. The main problem we're trying to solve is this lack of clinical data availability and the fact that our clinical records are siloed. So maybe uh, it's scary to learn that our doctors, uh, when they treat us and diagnose us, have about 17% of our clinical data history. 
And likewise, payers have claims data, uh, but they do not have our clinical data uh, when they're making approval and denial decisions. And we, as patients, only have about 1% of our uh, clinical data as well. So as you can imagine, this results in very high diagnostic errors and treatment errors uh, when our doctors are treating us. And that leads to skyrocketing costs uh, for payers, and specifically for the people who have chronic illness in the country, which is a, also a, a skyrocketing number. Uh, about 60% of people now have one chronic illness or more in the country. So these high cost patients are seeing many, many doctors because they see specialists as well as other doctors along the course of a year. And that leads to uh, the top 10% of patients resulting in about 70% uh, possibly of spend for their payers. So it's a, it's a problem that's becoming worse and interoperability and sharing of clinical data is the key to solving it. The reason why payers are so interested in solving this and why we believe we can help payers is that because of this lack of clinical data availability, in addition to the lives that we're losing, uh, payers are wasting an estimated trillion dollars per year uh, of avoidable costs. So let's take an example that we all know uh, really well. Every time we see a new doctor, we're asked to show up a half hour early uh, to the waiting room and we're given a clipboard and we're asked to fill out our lifetime clinical history on this clipboard as well as all the drugs that uh, and, and prescriptions that we're on. And so uh, we rack our brain and we try to remember everything, probably miss things. And that's what our doctor is using to treat us. So let's say we forget to mention one of the drugs that we're on or we list them incorrectly and list the wrong name for one of the drugs that we're on. Well, this new doctor uh, prescribes us a drug that interacts poorly with that drug that we didn't list because the doctor didn't know that we uh, were, were on that drug. And unfortunately, a day or two later, uh, we wind up in the ER. That's $38 billion of avoidable costs that payers are wasting due to that error. Because the interaction is so bad, uh, we, are, we have to spend the night in the hospital, maybe multiple nights. That leads to another $19 billion uh, of avoidable costs due to hospital stays. And then because the interaction was, again, so bad, uh, over the next six months, we have to uh, complete a bunch of follow-up appointments and tests, which leads to another $300 billion in cost for payers, all because our doctors didn't have a full clinical history of us. So potentially lives are lost and payers are wasting all this money because of the lack of connectedness in the healthcare ecosystem. Some of the other problems we're trying to solve and uh, in our conversations with Change Healthcare, so far we know that they're uh, trying to solve as well, uh, is the fact that payers are using claims data rather than clinical data. And claims data is not clin clinical data. Uh, payers are receiving the claims data one to four weeks after the appointment, but they need to make approval and denial decisions in real time, uh, either using incomplete data or delayed data. Uh, there's 500 different EHR formats out there. Uh, so there's not a, an easy way to get a holistic longitudinal view of normalized consolidated data. And we're excited to hear that uh, with their interoperability API change is, is trying to push that forward in terms of normalization of, of data from uh, disparate sources. And then lastly, uh, healthcare system lags behind as, as usual uh, in, in using faxes in this case uh, for 75% of patient data exchange, uh, which makes digital uh, digital first kind of analysis in terms of artificial intelligence and machine learning and all the other exciting technologies impossible to use, uh, further increasing these error rates and costs. So what we've created to help solve this problem and what we believe can be an uh, incredible front end uh, for some of Change Healthcare's functionality on the back end with their interoperability API is a patient app for consumers and their families uh, to use to empower them to lead this consumer mediated exchange of clinical data and to bridge together payers, patients, and providers. So you can see here a couple screenshots of what we've built. It's live today. Uh, you can see that you can manage not only yourself, but your family members and anyone that you're a caregiver for using the app there in the first screenshot. Second screenshot, regardless of doctors that you've seen, uh, all together holistically, you can see in a date range, a graphical view of your vitals, in this case, body temperature, heart rate, body mass index. On the third screenshot there, you can see a rolled up, finally holistic, longitudinal medical record for this person. And by the way, this is being powered on the back end by our parent company, Naprosoft's communications management software. It's enterprise software, actually Change Healthcare is one of our great customers of Naprosoft and has been for several years and uses Naprosoft for its communications management as well. So that powers Azuba on the back end in terms of communications and making this digestible. And then 
Lastly, you could see a transmission request. So now pa patients themselves are empowered to transmit their medical records directly to their doctors to share what they'd like to share. Again, the, uh, giving the consent to do so and actually being empowered to share on, on behalf of themselves or their family members. So let's sum it up with a couple of use cases to show you how we think this might work uh, with our front end and uh, the interoperability API on the back end. So we have our, our member, Megan, uh, and she has a daughter, Carly, who unfortunately has cystic fibrosis. And Megan, you can see in the screenshot on the right, is using Azuba for Carly. And first, she uses our provider directory to find a new in-network pulmonologist for Carly to see, and then is able to transmit Carly's clinical history or whatever she wants to share of Carly's clinical history to Carly's new pulmonologist. In addition to that, because Carly sees her primary care physician multiple times a year, uh, Megan is also able to, to trans set up a recurring transmission of Carly's uh, data uh, and encounters with her newest doctor, as well as all of her other specialists, to go back to the primary so that the primary can be kept informed and treat Carly appropriately uh, when they see Carly as well. So we've now been able to empower here Megan and Carly to receive better care and better outcomes and also help the payer in the long run because now the payer uh, is able to make better approval of denial decisions as well as uh, probably has less cost for Carly have receiving better care due to her providers having a full picture of her clinical history. Again, uh, we also wanted to mention that we have built an enterprise architected uh, platform here. So we have a uh, comprehensive support portal on the back end uh, as well. We, you can see on the bottom right here of the screen, we have almost 5 million active providers in our provider directory and that's updated on a daily basis in real time. And so in this case, we have our, Megan is able to also use our support portal uh, to, uh, in this case, log a request with our support agent, Dave. She sets, opens up a ticket, Dave receives it, and Megan is able to add her son, Ryan, uh, to her account and now begin to manage Ryan's care. Uh, Dave helps her link Ryan's records and, uh, and we go from there. So we just wanted to make, make sure that you knew this, in addition to being a front end smartphone app, we also have uh, enterprise architecture and support on the back end. So again, we really believe here that uh, you know the real time con consumer connected health is the future of medicine. We were uh, really excited to have that conversation with Change Healthcare as we learned about the interoperability API and that uh, and that Change believes the same thing. And we're excited to continue exploring a possible partnership on how we can work together and uh, and provide better outcomes for both payers and members. Thank you very much. Open up to questions. All right, who wants to go first? <laughs> Me. I passed to Laura. Um, hi, just really, this is, this is awesome. And uh, having dipped my toe in the payer side of the house in a previous life, I mean, this is a wonderful use case. Um, I'm curious though, because it's also a pretty compelling use case on the provider side of the house. Um, have you given any thought to that and sort of expanding your market footprint? So, so we have, um, we, we've thought about both and both our possibilities and we actually have a roadmap where uh, we, we do uh, go to market and our, our primary target would be uh, providers as well. Uh, I mentioned our parent company, Naprosoft. Uh, Naprosoft is uh, communications management software. And we, in addition to working with Change Healthcare and counting Change Healthcare as one of our great customers, uh, we have three out of the top four payers uh, and several others below that using Naprosoft for our communications, uh, for their communications management every single day. And so the reason why we targeted payers first and foremost here in this initial phase is because of our uh, you know, internal knowledge of, of knowing payers and uh, having those relationships. But we certainly mm -hmm. believe that providers uh, are, uh, you know, a, a great target as well and can stand to obviously benefit from this greatly. Yeah, I would also say that you guys should give some thought to, um, you know, the goal here is to create a frictionless ecosystem. And we all talk about payer and provider collaboration over and over and over again. Um, I would challenge you guys to think that about the use case where you really could help reduce that friction between payers and providers with this tool. So really good job. Thank you. Yeah, we, and we believe, you know, con consumer mediated exchange seems to be at the forefront, right? Especially as these 
uh, rule changes come about next year uh, with uh, you know the OEC and, and CMS, and so we believe that consumers will help lead that, and this is a way to bridge all three pr providers, uh, consumers and and payers. And just tagging on to, to Laura's comments, you know, ONC is is going to eventually enforce what they said they want to do in cures and information blocking. So you have an opportunity here, an interesting opportunity at that to, to use this tool to, uh, to get that EHI out and get it in the hands of the patients. Uh, my question though is more around business model. So who is paying for this today? And as you look forward, how do you charge for it? And you know, beyond your existing relationships with existing customers or customers from your parent, how do you bring it to market? Yep, so uh, our, our model is, uh, is PNPM. Uh, there's obviously a, uh, you know, a, a, a upfront license and startup fee is, uh, our goal is to have a kind of a quick start and for, for, uh, for payers and, and for that it to be made available to consumers through their payer potentially. Uh, and, and so it would be a PMPM model with some startup. Our goal is to come on board and help connect, uh, whichever members they want to have access in terms of demographics and preloading all of that. And then uh, from that point on, uh, it would be it would be PM, PM. So that's what we're thinking about in the initial phase. Bart, I don't know. Uh, I know Bart Carlson, our founder and CEO is on. I don't know if he wants to add anything to that. Or maybe Bart's dog. <laughs> yes, but that, that makes sense. Thank you, Greg. Great presentation. So Greg, this is Kristen. Great presentation and completely agree with kind of the the fact that we've got information all still in silos a gazillion years after we've been trying to <laughs> fix that. <laughs> the addition that I've seen a number of people trying to do payer provider back and forth, but bringing in the patient, I think is, is, is clever and interesting. How are you seeing this portal compare to and interact with the other um, patient facing tools provided by EHRs and other systems? Um, as kind of, there's a lot of people trying to kind of get the eyeballs of the patient. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we, we, we sit on top of that, right? It's the, it's the world of interoperability. So um, I think, as I mentioned, there's about 500 different EHR formats and that's kind of what's led to uh, this siloing of data. And so as, as you see with the HIEs and, and, and the like out there, uh, there needs to be something that sits on top of that, um, that it, you know, partners amongst all of them uh, to, to properly you know, put patients and, and payers uh, uh, first uh, to be able to uh, share that data and to you know, normalize. One of the things when we had the conversation uh, with, with Spencer and Joe, first learning about the interoperability API as we thought through this presentation, uh, we were excited about uh, their ability to normalize the data from those disparate EHR sources. And I think until you get a single holistic uh, longitudinal record um, that is uh, uh, collapses uh, the EHR formats into one format, but more importantly, uh, each of those EHR uh, formats are stored in encounters for every single appointment. So, as I mentioned, you know, a, a high cost patient could be having fifty or even a, you know hundred. I don't know how many doctor's appointments. Uh, or, or various encounters of, of, with doctors over the course of a year. And so the important thing is that uh, all of that data can be digestible in a single format and be ready, uh, especially to use uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all the other uh, uh, technologies that have, you know, are, are the next generation. Uh, like, you, like you mentioned, you know, health, even though it's life and death, kind of lags behind every other industry. We're able to move money uh, with a single click uh, and between our banks, you know, millions of dollars, uh, et cetera. But for something that's so important, uh, we're stuck using faxes and filling out paperwork on clipboards in doctor's offices. <laughs> I do love the clipboards. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. <laughs> I still have those. <laughs> Some pretty luminary uh, institutions too, scarily enough. <laughs> it's crazy, right? I mean. Yes, it is. say nothing of faxes. My goodness, it's 2020 after all. Exactly. And, and we're never going to get to that, that point where uh, all of these visions of, you know, the various startups and everyone doing great things uh, in terms of artificial intelligence and, uh, and machine learning and the rest of, you know, what's coming next in, in digital for all these other industries until we have digitized clinical records that are normalized in a format um, that, that, that you're able to do that in. So, you know, as, as long as we continue using faxes, it's not happening. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you so much, Greg and Bart, uh, for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Hey, good morning, every or good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex Baki. I'm a physician co-founder and CEO at Valhalla Healthcare. We're a team of doctors, data scientists, and developers have gotten together to solve some of the biggest problems in healthcare. And the main problem that we're initially solving right now is the amount of time that doctors are spending on the computer, which is about half of their clinic time. And that's unfortunately only leaving about 30% left for patients direct to direct face-to-face -face care. And how we're doing that is with our product in uh, Alivia. And Alivia is an intelligent patient intake tool that automates clinical notes for healthcare providers um, and, and in particular physicians. So this, here's how it works. So as soon as an appointment is scheduled, uh, you as the patient will receive a text message, an email, a portal notification, or all of the above, uh, since we can also integrate directly in the portal, where asking you say, hey, you know, thanks for scheduling your appointment, please fill out this pre-appointment questionnaire. Now, this isn't just any static pre-appointment questionnaire that you might be used to doing on that paper and clipboard. Uh, this is something that is tailored specifically for you, your chief complaint, your visit reason, even the specialty of the doctor, your medical history, and providing you kind of physician, clinician level intake to gather the most important clinical data elements necessary to, of course, Di, uh, you know, formulate a diagnosis, but then for our part to construct a clinical note in the documentation. So after about a five or 10 minute intake process that you do just on your phone or on the computer or on a tablet, even in the waiting room, we're able to pump that out into a draft clinical note directly into the EHR that's in the format that physicians are used to reading with the high yield material. Um, so they have this as essentially as a, as a door note before they even see you as the patient, which one lets them start from, uh, instead of starting from scratch, they have a template to begin with, but then two, they know a ton more about you and you don't have to go through all that back and forth clinical intake uh, when you see your doctor in the exam room. And for the value proposition, so we have some reductions and returns. So of course, the key reductions that we have are in the amount of time doctors are spending. So we save about six to 10 minutes per doctor per hour and reductions in some of the MAs, especially given now, which is really hard to stay open in COVID-19. And for some of the key returns is that uh, with that extra time, you can spend more time with your existing patients, see more patients, but we're also able to improve e &M accuracy with the 95 and 97 guidelines because we can gather that hard, you know, those hard HPI elements, the review systems elements. So the physicians don't have to go back and count and, and do all that, which is bringing in about you know, 10 to 60K per doctor per year in that saved revenue that would have otherwise been lost to undercoating. And with the factoring our costs and everything that it can go up to a 24X for these practices. And for attraction to date, we, uh, our key metric is the number of physicians subscribed and we have just over 700 and, and counting as well as some big collaborations with um, brand name health systems as well as some Fortune 10 companies that we're happy to disclose in a more private conversation. And now for the most important part is exactly how are we gonna move in change now that we know a little bit about our product and what we do. So as you know, from the overview we just discussed, our, our bread and butter is capturing clinical data elements from the patient, engaging that physician level intake and passing that over to the doctor in the form of a note. But why stop there? Because when you have the patient's attention, what we should be able to get is the other aspects of the clinical visit, which are you know collecting insurance for new patients, giving a copay estimate and balances. And that's exactly what change does for their bread and butter. And so why not help that process, which is gonna be better for the patient. It's gonna be that streamlined approach. And then of course the physicians to get them the money that they need to keep the practices open, especially your smaller practices who have trouble collecting these balances. And because we love algorithms as well, as much as you guys do, I don't know, maybe even more. It's, it, we'll have to, might have to fight over that one. Um, want to give you a step-by-step step of how exactly we're going to use some of your APIs. So first in the scheduling process, either on the phone or on a portal, you know, the patient can schedule with that kind of all the, the normal go-to and they'll receive a link to our intake, as you can see here in the middle part. However, with the new shop, shop book and pay API, the patients can directly do that themselves without having to go through that, you know, really disjointed process. And that's all, also bundles in together a bunch of things all at once. But let's go through that first scenario as well to get to see the other APIs in play. So 
during our step within our Alivia platform, the patient uh, enters their demographics and insurance information. So this is where eligibility V3 comes in because the patient will put in their demographic, social security number, name, gender, age, the, and then from our end for the provider, the NPI, right? The provider, every, all that information will give an estimate then down, downstream because we can pull then the plan, which includes the copay, the co-insurance amount, you know, the group numbers, all that good stuff. And that will come downstream as I mentioned. Then for this third step, they engage in that, what we do, the clinical level intake that is adapted to that patient. And then for the final step in our summary page, this is where that downstream effect comes in, using the patient responsibility estimator to be able to give the patient an estimate of their copay for that visit and potentially paying off any balances that may exist from previous visits. And with the ability with the transaction V2 to collect the payment right then and there, or even process a little bit later on in the form of a statement. And that is an end-to-end -end with seamless uh, interaction with our technology. And it would look like something like this, which is an existing a screen from our technology and potentially something like that for with their clinical summary and their copay amount. And Change Health is going to help our businesses grow because we currently charge a 195 per provider per month fee for our system, but with the help of Change's um, awesome, you know, uh, administrative and RCM APIs, we can actually boost some of the offerings that we can provide to our clients currently with partic particularly those APIs that were just mentioned in the previous slide. And right now, since we have about 726 providers, we're significantly growing with our existing contracts with health systems, uh, IPAs, A and ACOs, and MSOs, that we're going to be able to uh, approach potentially 20, about 25K transactions of patients per day. And that's, of course, means that we can help change healthcare, provide a synergistic financial opportunity for change healthcare. And that's not all. This is our primary focus, but there's significant synergy downstream because we're an AI machine learning company at our core with the clinical data elements that we collect and our data model. And we're looking to partner in the future after uh, the first quarter of 2022 to focus on some of the CDS hooks that you provide, providing our, our, our unique data model and data streams to combine with analytics for your current customers in the payer and health system uh, uh, landscape. So this is just the beginning. And um, with that, we're looking forward to potentially working with y'all Thank you for your time. And we're Valhalla Healthcare and we're helping doctors reduce documentation time right now, but together we can definitely change healthcare for the better. Thank you. Yeah, no, I was gonna say great, great, uh, great presentation. Nice job uh, and love the way you're incorporating our APIs, obviously. Um, the, you know, the question I've got on the, the platform, right? For, so it's, it's kind of interesting, right? For the 295 a month, right? You know, the primary value prop that you've articulated so far is around uh, just basically work reduction to the provider. Do you have a way to sort of illustrate that or that you would use when you present or, or pitch that to a provider in terms of, you know, what they could save or what's the kind of ROI associated with your platform? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, the primary ROIs, and, you know, for all of our clients to date, um, the thing is they've been brought to the upper leadership, especially our health system customers, by physicians, Physicians know instantly the value proposition when they hear us or present. It helps that I'm a physician. It helps that over half of our team are physicians, including the developers. We have full stack engineers that are current hospitalists practicing. So that really speaks to how we approach the problems in particular. And because of that, the physicians already know the value proposition like that. But when it comes to the finances, we also have the hard ROIs in the form of the undercodes, which are about 20% currently, which is a significant amount of money that's left on the table we help with that because we can capture all those clinical data elements and they don't have to fear about being able to code and then having an audit because their notes are actually can resist those audits. Um, and then of course, really the main ROI for these physicians, especially in your small to medium sized practices is time. They wanna be able to have more time and we help do that. So they don't have to spend as much on the HPI, the review systems, and it's their choice what they spend that time. And I think that's the key value proposition for them is that autonomy to decide what they do with that time. No, absolutely. You know, certainly, uh, you know, was, was curious, the, you know, the care and uh, capture that in the billing. So uh, helpful, thank you.
Alex, great presentation. T tell me a little more about that. Sorry, a little bit more about your uh, data strategy. How do you get data out of the system? Obviously, you're capturing a lot of it, and, and how are you thinking about in terms of you know greater interoperability, fire, those kind of things? You know, I'm glad you brought that up because that's our key long-term strategy. We are providing value today in the firm of that form of workflow optimization. Um, at the same time, what you know, and, and part of what powers this workflow optimization of being able to extract the relevant clinical data and constructing that into a note is we're really kind of putting it on its head the way that healthcare data is seen and extracted to currently. AWS and even, you know, your IBM Watsons currently tap into notes first for the, extracting their clinical data elements and extract out of that. We flip it on its head. We collect the clinical data elements first and then construct the note because that allows us to be in control of the quality of the clinical data that is extracted. Otherwise, you have too much variance and variability across different providers, um, you know, of different specialties or just even the same specialty based on their own way of practice and with the inherent inaccuracies that are, of course, involved in one well, humans, but then also in physicians, we can account for that and provide significant quality of data. And because of that, we have tens of thousands of discrete clinical data elements that do not exist in the EHR because the EHR is just simply positive chest pain, negative chest pain. We do left-sided chest pain with pressure described as a pressure in the retrosternal associated with improvements with nitroglycerin and you know over the other other over-the-counter information worsening with exercise. Each one of those single data elements creates a discrete, it exponentially creates a different, you know, total number of elements that have a quantity associated with them to a particular disease, but then a disease to a person. So I know that might not be the huge scope, but that's kind of our, our realm where we're looking to get into starting more in 2022, where from our internal data model, we can actually map out to FHIR, to H well, we do that now, but we can improve on FHIR HL7 because even in FHIR, which is our most latest and greatest, doesn't account for significant amounts of clinical data elements, um, right. like social history and uh, and really key data elements in there. That's the key uh, difference in us. Great, thanks. Alex, it's Kristen, really great presentation and uh, something that's near and dear to my heart, just coming from Nuance, <laughs> know a little bit about notes. <laughs> but you know, one of the, you talked about time savings for the physicians and I'm very much familiar with the problem of pajama time with the EHR. Um, but there are a number of clients out there that actually contemplated this workflow improvement and being able to drive capacity and throughput. Have you gotten any data around actually modifying the workflow to be able to get more patients through the door? That's a really good question. Um, we haven't at this point in time. Our, our mantra is, especially knowing that most of our us, our physicians, is clinical workflow is very delicate. Um, physicians are very, um, let's say, defensive of their workflow, don't like to be told what to do. They don't like change. Uh, no pun intended, and you know, sorry, they, you know, they don't like the change. Actually, the verb, not the noun. Um, <laughs> I'm sure they love change, the noun. Uh, so that, that's the key aspect, and that's I think our value proposition is that we're going in and adapting to the workflow because the physicians with our technology right now never interact with it ever. It's all fully patient facing. It's integrated with the EHR and drops the note as a draft format in the EHR, so they have that for chart review before they see their patient. They never engage with our platform whatsoever. So that's a key value proposition we provide. But however, moving forward and studying further as we have more customers growing and more feedback from the physicians, we are definitely keen on, on studying how can we, you know, take some best, you know, best practices and see if we can study them, you know, publish, even publish the data and then maybe recommend and help other physicians or providers or practices or networks that are struggling with this workflow and help provide that additional value to them. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Robbins. I am the co-founder and COO of Advocatia. And at Advocatia, we deliver the confidence that every individual is connected to the resources and programs that they qualify for allowing them to have the freedom to access the care they need in the hospital systems we work with to receive reimbursement for services rendered. The genesis of our company came as we assisted a family in enrolling their deceased mother, Avila, into Medicaid. Through that process, we learned that their mother had lived and worked blocks away from the hospital. She had accessed the emergency room for her primary point of care, for things such as a cut or an ear infection, but it never hit the threshold of a dollar amount for someone at the hospital to assist her through this process 
or did she know that she qualified for Medicaid? Unfortunately, Avila had delayed care for her stomach pains, and by the time she arrived at the emergency room, she had stage four stomach cancer. Avila passed away within four short days, and through this process, we thought that there had to be a better way. There had to be a better way to assist patients in understanding what programs they're eligible for and communicating with them as proactive proactively as possible, as well as there had to be a better way for hospital systems to communicate with their uninsured and underinsured and make sure that we can connect them to the programs they're eligible for. Avila was not alone. Um, uninsured patients delay care nine months longer than the insured population and are twice as costly to our healthcare system. There was $38 billion spent annually in uncompensated care, and these numbers were from the American Hospital Association pre-COVID. 20 billion of that could have been allocated to appropriate financial assistance programs if patients were, at, were aligned with the appropriate financial assistance programs such as Medicaid. We're continuing to see this number rise as 32 million individuals have lost their jobs and upwards of 9 million have lost their insurance during COVID. So why is it so difficult to navigate these programs? We've seen that there's the, in the increased program complexity and eligibility requirements, causing a large amount of time to be trained for hospital staff or any organization that may be helping with enrollment into programs such as Medicaid, hospital-specific charity care, or any county program. Additionally, there's stretched thin hospital staff. Due to the 24-7 nature of healthcare, the ED patients may not be, uh, may not be on site when at the same time that a financial counselor or community health worker may be. And additionally, there's outdated and siloed technology that we're seeing um, many processes that we've discussed today are still being dependent on mailing letters and submitting faxes. And advocacy is changing that for our partners. We work with over 200 healthcare systems across the country in 23 states. We're programmed for all 50 states to align with the appropriate programs so that every individual knows what programs they qualify for and has assistance with that enrollment. We empower individuals to find this out on their own by using our text messaging or our self-service tools to answer questions and help complete those applications. As well as our technology accelerates internal workflow for healthcare systems and facilitates that alignment with patients to the appropriate payers and resources. And of course, we leverage the best in breed technology and information on eligibility by partnering with organizations like Change Healthcare's Pocket Doc to check eligibility. We know that there's no way that we can continue to throw people at this problem. Pre-COVID, there was an outstanding amount of people and hospitals were having a hard time assisting patients, especially face-to-face. -face. Technology was needed. And as we see COVID continuing to increase that number, there's still no way hospitals can screen every patient that does not have insurance present at the time of their care. And hospitals and communities are in this financial crisis. Advocacia ensures through our technology that we can help every individual enroll into the programs they're eligible for. One of the first steps of that is managing the eligibility spectrum. We look at the best in breed technologies and ensure that an individual, if they already have coverage, go into the workflow that's appropriate within their healthcare system. So let me show you what that looks like. Our benefit screening technology is our robust decision engine tool that, that our healthcare systems use to empower their workflow. We integrate with EHR systems, um, several Epic, Cerner, but largely many of our customers are on Epic. We have that information come into benefit screening in real time. By using Change Eligibility's API, we're able to then immediately check if that patient may already have coverage. They may have been unaware, they may have not had their insurance card, or perhaps registration was not able to apply it to their account. This allows for the hospital staff to then look at what makes sense for their workflow. For example, financial counselors are typically using our benefit screen tool. So if someone does have eligibility, we want to ensure that that goes to the biller, that their EHR system is updated, and that they can, they can follow the appropriate workflow. However, if the individual is true self-pay or looking for eligibility into other programs, they can continue with the hospital screening for that patient's eligibility, auto-completing multiple forms in our decision engine tool, and then having the hospital receive needed information such as pay stubs electronically, capturing electronic signature, and then submitting that application right from our system. 
During COVID, as we saw an increase of uninsured individuals, as well as some hospitals not having the capacity to assist their patients, those that did not have an eligibility check during this workflow, we saw that 43% of those patients had insurance that was not identified at the time of care. That means that individuals that are helping with this, navigating this process, we had to filter out that 43% before they could focus on the 57% that really needed their assistance with enrollment into programs. Of the 43%, 7% of those had to have the hospital staff member call them and find out what their insurance was, also inconveniencing the patient, but taking needed time away from those resources and community members who needed assistance. And our, again, our benefit screening um, to platform, our robust decision and tool is enhanced by Change Healthcare's. Uh, we use Pocket Doc. Some of our partners also use MDON. And doing that check first to make sure that they are focused on those that are truly self-pay. We then boost the team's seamless workflow and allow them to complete multiple applications. On average, in the time that it may have taken to do one Medicaid application, they're able to complete two or three additional applications such as a SNAP enrollment or other community programs. And it also delights the patient and allows the patients to have the confidence that they're connected to the resources and programs and conveniently as possible. Again, our self-service tools allows them to I'll screen at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and ensure that information goes back to empower the teams in our healthcare system across the country. And future um, uses of Change Healthcare's eligibility API, we see this in our self service tool to allow the patient to answer questions and communicate to them if they already have coverage in some programs or what that might look like. There's ample opportunities to utilize different APIs within Change Healthcare to then go back to the patient and let them know their options. Again, we have a robust specialized solutions that we integrate with the best of breed technologies to ensure that we're helping our over 200 healthcare facilities that we work with across 23 states and we're programmed for all 50 states to assist with state and federal programs. Again, I'm Laura Robbins with Advocacia. Thank you so much for your time. Hello, Laura, Kristen, Yakimo. Nice to meet you and great presentation. Thank you. Um, just curious about the, the business model, the 23 state coverage in the 200 healthcare facilities is pretty awesome. And, you know, the, I didn't realize the 43% was so high. So clearly a big problem. How, who, are the health facilities paying for this or are the states paying for this? Who actually, you know, um, writes the check? Yes, today our partners include hospital systems, social determinants of health companies, um, as well as payers. So we do have a combined approach and some physician offices as well. And of those three segments, just kind of what the split is in terms of kind of where you're getting traction, because to your point, you can see this benefiting a lot of folks. Our most traction comes from uh, healthcare systems that we partner with, um, specifically with their uninsured and underinsured to ensure increased reimbursement and decreased bad debt. Okay, perfect, thanks. And also um, our team has that experience within healthcare systems and over a hundred years of experience combined working. Um, so I do think that's where we wanted to start and make sure that we had our efforts as we initially launched um, and continue to expand. Thanks. Great, Laura, very impressive. An important problem that you're solving with the team. What are some of your greatest barriers to going to market? Um, so I would say originally some of our biggest barriers were that people thought that the underserved community didn't want to communicate SMS text message or may have not had access to a smartphone. Um, our early conversations with CFOs and healthcare systems allowed us to educate that, you know, studies show that that's not true. Um, that's why we have the, the text messaging availability. 78% of individuals have a, um, under making 35,000 a year, I believe what this, the study showed, do have a smartphone and 98% have SMS um, text messaging ability. So overcoming some of those items, I think, you know, a lot of people have started to look at Medicaid and looking at those individuals that are on those programs or the underserved community more as consumers in healthcare as we move towards that. Um, but that was our largest barrier as we first launched and wanted to make sure that the underserved community could communicate and what's most convenient for them. And during multiple hours, we see several text messages come over at 2 a.m., um, 11 p.m. times that a financial counselor is not available to answer those questions and share with them that they are eligible for Medicaid or other programs. 
That's great. Great job over coming in. Hey, Laura, this is Edmund Monsur. Thank, thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, you mentioned that you discovered that 43% already have already have some level of coverage, 57% don't, so you want to focus on that 50, 57%. From the standpoint of getting them enrolled, and maybe I missed this, but from the standpoint of getting them enrolled in, in, the, in the right program, um, is there support to do that, or is it self-guided, or or how are they directed to get the right level, of, get enrolled in the right to, the right, to, uh, right, right coverage capability? Yes, that is um, exactly what our solution does, is make sure that first and foremost, um, and if the patient can do that, they can do a self-service tool that we can send a link to them. The hospital staff can send a link to them. It can be SMS text messaging that we do a process um, that we refer to as a quick screen so they can answer seven to 10 questions and learn on their eligibility, um, the, what programs they're eligible for. And then from there, our tool, um, some of our clients, like one in Ohio has 45 programs. So once you've identified that they're eligible for the programs and you're helping them with that enrollment, on the back end, our tool is auto-filling multiple applications that they're able to complete for the individual and then submit straight from our platform to the needed entity, whether that be a local DHS office, to another department that's handling charity care within the hospital, or even a community program that the patient may be eligible for. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for one more quick question. So one more quick question. How many patients, can you, do you know about how many patients are actually using your tool? Um, we've assisted over 150,000 patients um, and we've had more than that um, communicate with our tool, but for the actual submission piece. Okay. And I will say we've had a 65 to 75% response rate from text messages in the ED specifically for one case study that we did. So having that inbound communication from patients, especially in the underserved has been um, made a huge difference, especially as they move teams remote um, in a COVID environment. Great, nice work. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I can't see everyone. So I'm coming from like all of you, one meeting to another. It's nice to see some of the names, some of my teammates from Change Healthcare. Hey, Laura, as well as many others. Um, I'm real happy to be here. I'm joining you from Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, which is probably colder than Chicago today. Um, I'm really happy we're part of this. And I wanted to share just a thought or two before I hand it over to my teammate, Chris, who hopefully is being able to um, uh, dial in. Um, behind me, you see the vision statement of change healthcare, inspire a better healthcare system. And as I think about what you guys have been doing uh, today and even leading up to today and after today, I wanna highlight two words in there. The first word, because every word was very deliberate when we put that vision statement together, is inspire. And we chose inspire because we don't own it, we don't build it, we're not creating it, we're inspiring it. We know healthcare is a team sport, and it's because of that we want to work with the collaborative transformers that are really inspiring things to happen. In the second word, a better way. I think it's fair to say everybody in our organization is restless. We're restless in terms of uh, wanting to change the status quo. We know that innovation requires restlessness and creativity. So when I put those two words together, inspire and better, and I wrap them into our vision statement, it's kind of a, a no brainer that we're part of this with the Matter team and everybody that's presenting. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris if he's joined. Um, I know he's having a couple technical problems, but I'll defer to Casey to see if he's been able to. I'm on. Can you all hey, hear Chris. me? Hey, okay? Chris. Yeah. Hey, Tom. Hi, everyone. It's so great to join you all. Um, as, as Tom mentioned, we really take our role in the ecosystem as humble assemblers, if you will, of the innovators at, at times very seriously. So I'm excited about everything that you all are doing today. Um, anything that brings us closer to the ground in terms of touching the entrepreneurs and feeling their energy 
is always extremely welcome uh, in, my, in my book. So healthcare innovation sometimes feels like farming in the desert. I think we've all, all felt that. Um, it seems like uh, although there's a strong need for the innovation, there are so many challenges to address, but it feels like the entire system is working against you to kill your great idea. So um, all I can say is, you know, welcome to healthcare. Uh, it's one of the most difficult industries to innovate in for so many reasons. But fortunately, um, it's pretty obvious from the, from the teams that, that have assembled here today that it has not stopped entrepreneurs from uh, willing to take up the fight, from willing to uh, innovate, and um, from willing, in, in fact, to die on the hill if you have to in, in trying. So partly this is due to the fact that, you know, so many of the inefficiencies in healthcare are somebody's revenue. And when you talk about billions of dollars of inefficiencies, you're talking about a lot of people's jobs. So it's not surprising that innovation faces a lot of headwinds when you're trying to do it from the ground up. And one of the most exciting parts of my job is working with companies that are trying to innovate and that are trying to innovate at scale. And I like to say that, you know, being in a platform business is uh, somewhat tricky because on the one hand, you want to do things at scale. And that means you try to do everything yourself because you, know, you have big networks, you want to do everything yourself. On the other hand, um, if you try to go down that path too much, you end up not getting anywhere. The reality is healthcare is too big and too complex for any one company, no matter how big, to really crack um, on their own. And that means that you have to go down the path where you have like-minded road warriors, so to speak, who can travel um, that journey with you, who are willing to invest, who are willing to take risks. And it's the, the most, you're having the most amount of fun when different people are playing different roles and it all comes together like a nice symphony. That's the thought anyway. Um, it doesn't always come together in a, as a nice symphony. Sometimes it sounds like a bunch of teenagers randomly playing their instruments. But um, I think what we try, always try to do is to play up with people's strengths. Tom and I have been involved in a number of activities where we have seen people bring great ideas to us and challenge us. Say, hey, you're change healthcare. Can you do this? You know, if only you could do that. You know, we could do this or that. And it really makes us think hard about how we can bend over backwards sometimes to help. And we love doing that. So I'd like to congratulate all the teams that have pitched today, all the fantastic ideas. I can't wait to see what comes out of this and uh, not only the winners, but, but all the participants and all of their great ideas. Sometimes I feel like there's no bad idea in healthcare. It's just a matter of timing. You know, a terrible idea from three years ago would be a fantastic idea three years from now. So it's about what, what curve you're on and at what point in your journey you are. So again, congratulations to all the teams that have pitched. And it's not a matter of whether you win or, or lose. It's a matter of playing the game. We are all in this game together. Um, anything that we can do from the change healthcare perspective to encourage you to innovate, to bring the cost of innovation down and also to take some of the risk away. We know that as entrepreneurs, you face so many risks when you start a new business. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very long list of, uh, of headwinds and risks that you take on. If we can help take one or two of those risks out for you, we would be overjoyed. And if we can see some of these ideas go from seeds to, to plants and then uh, full-blown trees, even better. Yeah, great. All right, so before we before we announce the winners, and I cannot believe I'm about to make a you're all winner speech because I'm not really going to make that speech. <laughs> Those of you with kids know how this part goes. Um, but in, in all honesty, and from the heart, you know, we we are all engaged in the most probably the most important piece of work that we can all do in our lifetimes, right? And that is making sure that patients get the best possible care that we drive patient's health outcomes and ultimately make this healthcare system of ours much, much more efficient and better for the people that we serve. And those people are ourselves, our families, our friends, as much as everyone else around us. So before we say anything, you know, we are, we're so proud to be part of this event. We're so proud to be able to enable everybody to take this step, 
to make the health of the populace better and ultimately drive everyone to their outcome. So thank you all for that. Thank you for your partnership and thank you all for your passion in doing that. You know, I, don't, I will speak for myself and I know that I probably speak for a lot of you that you know, when you get up every day and you climb this hill, sometimes those challenges are hard. Sometimes they're a little, <laughs> a little daunting and it's this passion that keeps us going. So thank you all for that. And I'm sure my, my fellow judges would echo that, that same sentiment. That said, let's get to the thing that I know you all want to hear. And that is the, the three winners of our contest. I will tell you the, um, the voting was close and the scores were close. And, and you know the, the difference between first place and second place here was literally a point. So everyone did an amazing job and you all presented your cases really well. That said, and I apologize if I mispronounce any one of these names, uh, but Kliexa, congratulations. You took first, followed by Clearstep. Congratulations, you took second. And Advocacia, if I got that right, congratulations, you took third. So great job, everybody.